Okay, welcome everyone. And uh, this is a CLC meeting for October 7th. And uh, can we go through introductions? Um, I think the best way to do this is for me to um, go through, uh, to, to ask people to introduce themselves based on the window that I have. So I'm gonna start off on my window, the top left, Colin. Yes, Hi everyone, Colin, Colin Fisher with CBCL. Oh. Oh, uh, sorry, there's two Collins. Colin Fisher. <laughs> Colin Fisher first. Hi, everyone. I'm Colin Fisher from CBCL. I'm Ken Donnelly, the chair of the CLC with Beyond Attitude Consulting. Shalina, can you introduce yourself? Hi there. I'm Shalina Thornton. I, I'm the administrative supervisor with West Hans Regional Municipality. Jim Ivey. Uh, Jim Ivey, Town. Okay, uh, Dave Crouchman. Yes, hello. Dave Crouchman, citizen representative, West Camp. Second, Colin, Colin Hines. Colin Hines, a uh, member at large from Falmouth. Julie Bailey. Uh, Julie Bailey, I'm the manager of environmental sustainability and climate change with the Department of Agriculture. Mayor, Mayor Zibian. Uh, Mary Abraham Zavian, uh, West Hands Regional Municipality. Justin? Yeah, Justin Tanner, I'm the Manager of Highway Planning and Design with uh, Transportation and Infrastructure Renewal. Uh, Sheldon Hope, um, <laughs> Sheldon's on his phone. Can, can you go ahead, Sheldon? Yeah, uh, Sheldon Hope with uh, Pittsburgh Canoe Club. Okay, great. Uh, Todd? Everyone, Todd Rochere, uh, Director of Public Works with West Hans Regional Municipality. Aaron. Aaron Porter, Commercial Fishery Representative of Fisheries. Lyle Russell. Uh, Lyle Russell, uh, Project Engineer, Department of Transportation. Kathy Keogh. Kathy Keogh, Director of Community Development, West Hans Regional Municipality. Anya Wood. Uh, you're, you're muted, Sonia. Sonia Wood, Chair of the Friends of the Avon River. Thank you, Sonia. Uh, Gail? Gail Tupper? Hi, uh, my name is Gail. I'm from Gloosecat First Nation. I manage the Natural Resources and Environment Office here. I'm also uh, coordinate their FSC fish fishery. And I'm a designated by DFO as an Aboriginal fishery guardian. Shelly? Shelly Bibby? Uh, Shelly Bibby, former councillor with the former town of Windsor. I think I'm still a citizen member, though. I think I joined this committee before I became a councillor. So I guess I'm a former town of Windsor citizen member. Mark? I'm Hi, Mark folks. Brace. I'm the senior highway planning engineer at TIR. Okay. Mark Phillips. Okay. Hi folks, Mark Phillips, CAO for the uh, West Hans Regional Municipality. Uh, just, oh, that's the other, that's uh, Bob Pett. Hi, it's Bob here. Sorry, I'm not on video. I'm the Senior Environmental Scientist with TIR. And Alexander Wilson. Hi, I'm um, uh, uh, Alexander Wilson from CBCL, uh, Water Resources Engineer. Hello, hello everyone. Thanks, everyone. Um, I don't think I missed anybody. Wave if you, if I missed you. No? Okay, great. Thank you, everyone. Um, I'm going to mute everybody um, for this, but uh, you can unmute yourselves later. Um, so just a couple things I want to talk about uh, the um, new members. So we have, um, you'll recall that I sent a note around asking people, giving them a chance to, um, to say if they wanted to uh, leave the committee or stay on. Uh, we had two people that left, uh, Randy Hussey, um, uh, who was on as a counselor has said that he's too busy. I didn't realize what he sells personal protective equipment and he's been just going crazy selling uh, this stuff since uh, COVID started. Um, so he said he, he uh, would step down. Andrew Sheehy sent me a note 
saying he would step down. I think Andrew only came to the first meeting, that was it. So, uh, but, um, so he, he said he would step down. Um, everybody else agreed to say, which I think is great. Um, we've got some changes due to uh, the change in the municipal status. So Jim Ivey, who has joined us before, um, standing in for Shelley Bibby, if I recall correctly in the past, um, when Shelley was unavailable. Uh, Jim's going, has joining the committee. Uh, Mayor Zevian is uh, joining the committee and CAO Mark Phillips is uh, joining the committee. So they're, they're municipal representatives. Um, we do have, uh, as we always, uh, as we often do at least, um, have uh, some observers for the municipality. Um, Todd's been to uh, some meetings before. Um, I'm looking for Todd right now. I don't Oh, there he is. Yeah, okay. Um, I thought you'd introduce yourself, Todd, but I couldn't, didn't see your picture. Um, so, so Todd's uh, um, going to join, or, or is sitting in, and so is Shalina sitting in as uh, staff members of the municipality. Um, so, and we've got, uh, of course, some people from the project team and, uh, and consultants. All right, so the next thing that we're going to do, I was gonna put up the agenda, but I think I'll just run through it. I've got it here um, because it's pretty simple. The next thing is um, to have a presentation on um, the Highway 101 twinning update. So um, what I'd like to do just to try and manage this, and I appreciate everybody having a lot of uh, um, patience here because uh, many of us, I've been spending all week on Zoom and uh, uh, another platform um, pretty well all day uh, um, attending a conference and having meetings and that sort of thing. I think many of us are probably really used to this, but some others aren't. And uh, so if, as I said before, if you have some problems, any problems, just enter them into the chat. Um, and what I'm going to do is ask the project team now uh, shortly to um, give that Highway 101 twinning update. If you have questions, please type them into the chat window. That way you don't, because we're going to let the presentation come go right to the end. We're not going to interrupt them. Sorry, I have to put my dog down. Uh, no, not put my dog down. <laughs> put my dog on the floor. Um, the... Uh, uh, so we want them to uh, be able to finish the presentation. If you have any questions, you can type them into the chat. That means you don't have to try and remember them till the end. And I'll go through the questions and ask them. Um, and if you have any clarification, we can we can do that too. So I hope that will work for everyone. And give with that, uh, Justin, um, can I ask you to start the presentation on the uh, Highway 101 twinning update? Absolutely, I'll watch that right now. All right, can everybody see that okay? All right. Uh, so as I mentioned in the introductions, uh, my name is Justin Tanner. I'm the manager of highway planning and design with TIR. Uh, I also oversee the contract uh, that CBCL is involved in with the uh, design of the Avon River Abito and the cause we upgrading. So uh, just a little overview of our, our presentation today. Uh, first up, we'll, we'll be talking about an update on the, the progress of the, the 20 construction. Uh, so Lyle uh, Russell, uh, project engineer, will give a little bit of an update on that. Uh, and then we're gonna move on to the Avon River Abito and Causeway design. Um, so first off, uh, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of context and go back into some of the background and uh, the history uh, that, that led us to where we're at today with the current approach and what our next steps are. And then we'll hand it over to CBCL, who's gonna dive more into some of the specific details uh, around the design. So with that, I guess I'll uh, hand it over to Lyle Russell, uh, who will do an update on the, uh, on the twinning construction. And uh, Lyle, you just let me know when you want me to uh, advance the slides. Okay, thank you, Justin. Um, this here, first, uh, I guess, uh, map uh, drawing, I think most uh, everyone has seen in the past, uh, but basically it's showing uh, what, as we go through it, you'll, you'll hear us talk about sections. 
And basically what it's showing here is where these sections are applicable. So we have uh, the first section of uh, the twinning project is basically from uh, three mile planes um, where the twinning uh, currently stops, which is from four lane uh, to two lane, all the way up to roughly the Windsor Railway overpass um, is, is referred to as section one. Section two is the piece in the middle uh, from Windsor Railway overpass um, through exit six, the causeway area, exit seven, and down to where the Falmouth uh, Railway overpass is. Um, and then, of course, section three is basically from that Falmouth overpass as we head to the valley back to where we've switched from two lane to uh, four lane highway um, in uh, just before Hansport. So uh, that's kind of a, a breakdown on the sections. Um, so as we'll go through, we'll go through section one first. Um, so work to date on section one, we have completed uh, basically the new west, what will be the new westbound lanes have been constructed and paved. Um, and they they are currently open to two lane, two way traffic. Um, so that's what everyone's driving on uh, currently. Um, we are working uh, diligently on the Windsor Railway overpass and we are expecting we complete that here in the next couple of weeks. Um, and I know a question that people are probably going to ask is about the, the, I guess, the barrier to kind of detour S turns that are currently over that. Our goal is to have them removed by uh, the second week of November before um, the winter comes. So that is what we're working on uh, right now. Um, this fall um, and winter, we're going to work on the existing highway, which is what will be the new eastbound lane. So we're working on upgrading, widening, um, doing some grade changes there. Uh, we're also replacing the Trunk 14 and Wentworth Road overpass structures. Uh, and actually, if you've been through lately, you'll see that the Trunk 14 structure has been removed um, and the Wentworth Road structure is uh, scheduled for demolition next weekend. So again, we're looking at completion for that project spring 2021, somewhere in the June, June area. Um, following that on section one, this summer, spring, summer, we're looking at coming right in behind and uh, paving that section of what was the eastbound, or well, will be the eastbound lane. So we're, we're gonna work on that very quickly um, and hopefully have, uh, at least the first phase of twinning opened up by uh, fall 2021. All right, Justin, next one. Um, so section uh, two, so we kind of got that broken up into a couple spots. So we'll call section two A, uh, which is basically from that Windsor Railway crossover to exit six. Uh, we are currently working on subgrade construction for the new westbound lanes. Um, and we're expecting to have that completed by the end of uh, this calendar year. Involved in this section, we did do a fairly extensive uh, extension to the Cothic Creek uh, box culvert, as well as we have done some improvements and uh, some protection of the municipal water infrastructure that currently goes under the highway in a couple spots. So that was part of that whole uh, section. Um, very shortly should be done by fall. Next one. Um, so this is basically just a, a kind of a picture showing the existing highway um, and then uh, on the very left of the picture you'll see where the, the new uh, westbound lanes are, are currently being constructed. Um, so this is this is where it is and the, the little green spot there was uh, where that Dracothic Creek uh, box culvert is. Alrighty, um, next section um, is section 2B which is uh, what we're referring to uh, between exit 6 and exit 7. Um, so basically, you know, the two interchanges in the causeway. Um, so under construction currently is the uh, widening of the existing causeway which uh, pretty well involves the construction of a new rock tow berm um, as well as uh, looking at some preload fill being done. So we're going to edit, we're installing some preload fill, working on some wick drains to help with the consolidation of the fine grade sediments and our expected completion for this uh, preliminary work on the causeway widening is uh, later this fall. Uh, exit 6 interchange and Nesbitt Street connector, we are looking at doing some subgrade construction this fall. Uh, very shortly, there's some uh, ground improvement to be done there uh, with some of these wick drains as well. 
Um, so we're expecting to start that this fall and uh, sometime in the uh, calendar and before the end of the calendar year. Uh, we have some subgrade that is going on happen between Avalon River and Exit 7, basically through uh, the field that's right next to the Avalon River. And we are actually going to be starting that tomorrow. And uh, we are expecting to complete most of that new highway embankment before the end of the calendar year. And the other thing that we do have going on in this area is the actual exit seven interchange um, structure and the ramps. We are looking at potentially getting that going this winter with a, a late fall tender uh, with a completion for late uh, 2021. So that'll be a new interchange um, and uh, demolition of the existing uh, interchange. Alrighty, next one. So uh, basically this is a picture here showing uh, kind of a close up of uh, the causeway widening. And what, uh, what you're seeing here where the truck is kind of driving is the, the new rock tow berm. And uh, it's, it's kind of deceiving in the picture, but the actual tow berm is much wider than what uh, the, the truck is actually driving on. Um, it's almost the full width of where the, the rock actually is. Um, to the right, you can see temporary dike. Um, so basically what they're what we're doing here is we've got temporary dike keeping the water out of the construction site and we're starting our basically our cleanup process pulling back all that uh, material and uh, getting stuff shaped and rated uh, next one and this is just kind of a bigger overview where you can see to the right kind of temporary diking um, the kind of what the, the rock fill tow burn looks like and uh, like i say we're, we're that mo majority of this has been cleaned up, pulled back, and uh, regraded and shaped. In between that rock berm and the existing road is where we are working on some preload filling and then wick drain installation. Um, alrighty, we're going on to section three. So that section three is basically coming from that exit seven down to the existing twinning that's in the Falmouth uh, before Hansport area. So we've currently been working on uh, some new eastbound lane uh, construction from where the twinning uh, four lane currently ends. So we've worked on some new twinning there last year. Uh, we've done the subgrade work this year. We've done some paving and uh, that is complete. Um, so the paving wrapped up uh, about a month ago. Part of that project, we did do a wildlife uh, structure um, crossing underneath the highway. So we've installed basically the part that would be under the uh, south side of the highway, under the eastbound lanes. Um, anyone that's traveled there lately has noticed there's kind of a detour there um, because we've installed and are working on installation of the north side of the, uh, of, the bot of the wildlife crossing. And that is expected to be completed to very shortly. Um, we should actually see some paving going on later this week to kind of finish that up. And we've also started uh, some subgrade construction from uh, where we left off on the eastbound lanes by the Falmouth uh, Railway overpass. We're basically picked back up there, uh, working our way back towards exit seven. Uh, we had an installation of a Elderton Creek box culvert extension done there. And we did have some water and wastewater infrastructure crossing there that we've uh, we done some uh, protection and uh, improvements too as well. So that's that, that section is wrapping up very quickly here as well. Uh, next one, Justin. So this is just uh, basically a picture showing, uh, this is kind of early on in the, the construction, but this is basically the new eastbound lanes. You're seeing the new trunk one structure there. Um, as of now, you'll see that that, that whole stretch has been uh, basically paved. Uh, next, it's just uh, again another one you can see kind of where the four lane divided is coming to the two lane highway. You can kind of see how that's going to look when we make the joint um, there. So that's kind of a close up where that red crane is in kind of the middle of the picture. That is where that uh, wildlife uh, crossing structure is. So I believe the next slide or two will give a kind of a idea. So this is the wildlife crossing. So basically it's a big uh, box culvert um, that's designed to allow, you know, a deer and other fair sized animals to be able to safely cross underneath the highway. 
and uh, you can get an idea of the size of it with the, the guys kind of standing uh, beside it. Um, so you, we've got some installation going on here. And do we have one more on this? Uh, that was it, Lyle. That's that was it. So that's there. that's yeah. the last one. So uh, yeah, that's kind of where we're we're at with construction uh, as of today. All right. Thank you, Lyle. Um, Ken, just wanted to throw this out there. Do we want to pause for questions on the twinning aspect where we're kind of at a, a break point, I guess, in topics? Um, if there are a few questions, we can probably entertain them now. Yeah, there's been no questions in the chat, but does anybody have any questions that, uh, that they haven't typed in? I just asked one question if I could, Ken. Yep. It's uh, Jim Ivy you. here. Um, back when you showed the um, uh, the aerial shots there of the uh, tow berm, um, and uh, there was the uh, the highway on the left, uh, the existing highway, and so on. There's been discussion around here as to which part is actually the highway. That uh, people that is there going to be water going in, like where that grass is, or am I? Uh, can you sort of identify where the the actual highway is going in here versus the tow berm and the and the dike? Lyle, did you want to speak to that or would you like me to? You got the pointer. Um, All right. You're, you're kind of in the, the idea there. Yeah, so just, just correct me if I'm wrong, but yeah, the tow berm represents the outermost limits of the, the new construction. Um, the actual new highway lanes are going to be on an embankment built within uh, or between uh, this tow berm and the existing lanes. So the new lanes are actually going to be inside here where that grass area is now. So that's, uh, as Lyle mentioned, uh, the preloading that's happening is actually uh, starting to build that embankment up to support the, the future highway lanes. And you'll see here, it kind of starts to curve off. And that's because, uh, as we'll show in some later diagrams, the actual highway alignment uh, uh, curves off at a different angle here. Uh, we're actually realigning some of the causeway towards the end. So that's why the alignment of the tow berm uh, kind of curls off there. That's great. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions? Okay, I think we can uh, then move on, uh, Justin. All right, thank you. Um, so apologies for the lighting. I'm actually in my office right now after hours and uh, the lights went off and I'm actually not sure how to reactivate them right now. So the lighting is a little terrible here, but uh, that's all right, you guys are gonna be looking at the slides anyway. So uh, for the next part of the presentation, I'm gonna be providing a general overview of uh, some of the history and the background information for the project and how we arrived at this, uh, at the current approach. Uh, I know there's uh, some folks that are, are maybe newer to the committee uh, and I just wanna get everybody up to the same uh, basic understanding of how we got to where we uh, currently are today. Uh, and then CBCL will be uh, delving further into the design option itself in a bit more detail after that. Justin, I'm just going to remind people that if they have yeah. questions during the presentation, type them into the chat and uh, we'll get to them later. Okay. Yeah, Thanks. thank you, Ken. Uh, so uh, the existing abattoir and the causeway uh, were originally constructed in uh, between 1968 and 1970, and they were uh, constructed to replace 26 kilometers of uh, historic dikes and 36 abattoir structures that were uh, previously upstream. Uh, but since that, since that time, much of the original dike land infrastructure uh, has, has been removed or is, or is naturally degraded over time. Um, the existing causeway and the abateau uh, are an integral part of the provincial dike system. Uh, so they provide cr critical flood protection for Windsor, Falmouth, and over 1,600 hectares of agricultural land. Uh, and if you include the non-agricultural -agric and community land, it actually uh, protects over 2,100 hectares uh, of, of, uh, of land area. Uh, many of you may understand the function of, uh, of the dike system, but uh, just a basic uh, overview. Uh, a dike is basically uh, an embankment uh, purposely built to protect land and infrastructure and other assets from coastal flooding. Uh, so the height and size of the dike uh, is often dictated by current or projected water levels and various risk factors. Uh, so in determining the, uh, the appropriate height of a, of a dike, uh, you often look at factors such as uh, the, the height of the tides, uh, waves, storm surge, sea level rise projections, and so on. 
uh, and an abato, uh, not shown in this picture, is basically the structure that controls or uh, contains the, the gate or gates uh, to prevent or control the flow, the flow of water between the protected area and the, uh, the coastal area. So the existing abato is at the end of life and uh, is, is coming due for replacement. Uh, so to ensure continued uh, flood protection, um, uh, it, it's, need, it's in need of replacement. Uh, which would otherwise not be possible with, with just bridges and free tidal flow. The system uh, is also vulnerable to storm surges and it requires upgrades to adapt to climate change and, uh, and those sea level rise projections that I mentioned. The existing abato was also not originally designed to accommodate fish passage, so it has very limited flexibility uh, in that regard. And failure of the abato gates, or if we were to say, uh, remove the abato entirely would result in a significant flood risk to Windsor, Falmouth and the surrounding area. This is a uh, image here uh, based on a flood model uh, that was produced by, uh, by CBCL. And, and this basically just illustrates uh, an extreme rainfall event uh, with storm surge. If the gates were removed from the current abato or if they malfunctioned and were left fully open, this is uh, the, the potential risk if we had uh, an extreme rainfall event with storm surge. Some of this flooding I just wanna note is also due to freshwater flow. So it isn't completely all tidal um, influence. I just wanna make sure that's, that's understood as well. So there's, there's flood risks on both sides uh, of the abato. And uh, that being said though, uh, the farmland in this picture, or much of the farmland in this picture would mostly be flooded uh, with salt water um, if this type of event took place. We shared this graphic in some past presentations, but I just wanted to uh, show it here again. Um, what this basically illustrates, many of you are aware with the Pizzawood Canoe Club, this is the, uh, the building down there on the waterfront. And I've shown a water or a line here that basically represents uh, a water level or a theoretical water level based on uh, a flood flood model or an early flood model that was done um, a number of years ago. Uh, and some this this level here is about 10.6 meters. So I've shown the elevation uh, in the bottom figure. Um, that's that's the uh, reference elevation of, of water based on a flood uh, prediction model. Some of our more recent models have actually had uh, had more up-to-date projection, projections ranging from 11 and a half to 13 and a half meters, which would actually put that water level um, up in the, uh, the, somewhere in the roof line of the, of the boat club. So you'll see that the current, the, the line here basically follows the top of the causeway. So that's roughly in the 10 to 11 meter range. Um, the new part of the causeway is being constructed to about a 12 and a half meter elevation. So it will also have the ability to be raised in the future to 13 and a half meters if some of those future flood projection models pan out. Um, so this will be about two meters uh, above the level shown here in this picture. And, uh, Justin, can I just step in here? Could I, could I have, some people are telling me that uh, they're here having some uh, uh, audio problems with you cutting out and I can hear you clearly. Uh, I'd ask people just to, um, if, those that aren't speaking to turn your uh, video cameras off and we'll try and reduce the amount of uh, bandwidth that's um, being being uh, sent across the ether here. Thanks Justin, go ahead. Yep, all right, thank you Ken. Um, sorry, just lost my train of thought here. So, so yeah, the top image shows the uh, the water level based on a flood model that was that was done and the bottom level shows basically the boat club uh, and a cross section of what a potential dike would be uh, required to uh, to that elevation. Uh, and as I mentioned, some of our more recent models actually have some heights even higher than this. So just to give you a sense of the um, the level of flood protection, I guess that would be required uh, along the Windsor waterfront. And, I know some, some others have mentioned in the past, a good analogy is if you took the causeway and you kind of pivoted it near the boat club and, and turned it and placed it in front of Windsor, um, that's the kind of embankment, I guess, that, you, that would be required to provide that level of flood protection. So the project objectives, I just wanted to highlight these real quick. Uh, first and foremost, the project uh, and, and construction of the new Abato and, and the twinning project, uh, the, their objectives are really focused around public safety. So continued protection of communities and agricultural land from the effects of flooding and sea level rise, uh, climate change, 
and to expand the corridor over the Avon River for the 101 twinning and, and for improving highway safety. Those are uh, the, the ultimate objectives first and foremost. But with any project, when you're trying to achieve those objectives, there, there are always regulatory requirements that we have to adhere to as well. Uh, and one of the, the probably the most significant is, is improving fish passage. This is a condition of the EA uh, or the environmental assessment and uh, required under the Fisheries Act. Uh, we also must consider, obviously, uh, potential negative impacts to asserted or established Mi'kmaq Aboriginal treaty rights. Uh, this is something that we, we take very seriously and we need to consider uh, any, any negative impact to, uh, to Mi'kmaq rights uh, in, in, in the process. And we also need to minimize uh, environmental impacts wherever possible. So trying to keep the uh, impact, for example, to the salt marsh uh, as, as minimal as we can. And uh, the last uh, item there is around minimizing the societal impacts as well. We always have to be uh, cognizant of uh, societal or economic impacts to, to communities, uh, businesses, farming, recreation as well. So these are all the things we try to consider in, in achieving the, the project objectives. Um, So uh, the current approach, as many of you are aware, is to construct a new abateau and upgrade the existing causeway. A little history on, on, on that here. The province decided uh, early in our planning process uh, that the most feasible option to ensure continued flood protection was to replace the abateau and upgrade the causeway. Uh, TIR partnered with the Department of Agriculture very early on to include the abateau and causeway twinning. Um, to include the abateau and the causeway with the twinning uh, due to that aging infrastructure that I mentioned and the need for greater resiliency to climate change and sea level rise. So the replacement of the abateau in conjunction with the highway twinning also limits some conflicts and risks between the infrastructure. So when you have a highway with bridges and an abateau and a river channel, there's a, all in a really tight close space. Uh, unless you look at it from a systems approach and, and you do it in a coordinated fashion, there's a lot of risks uh, to, to treating them in isolation. Uh, so we, we really looked at this as an overall system and how we could uh, uh, benefit off uh, each piece of infrastructure to provide overall value uh, to the project and uh, reduce the overall cost and uh, the burden to taxpayers. So an environmental assessment was approved for the Highway 101 twinning project in June 2017. Uh, this included the proposal for the new Alito and the upgraded causeway. Uh, the EA terms and conditions uh, required that the Alito must provide improved fist passage. And as a condition of that EA, uh, we had issued a uh, what we call communique or kind of a formal uh, doc, uh, uh, short report basically that summarized um, uh, the department's rationale for an abato and a causeway over other types of options, such as, as bridges, as, as some have suggested. And uh, I didn't mention this previously, but uh, basically that summary or that rationale document, really what it came down to uh, is, is the alternative option would be to uh, construct about 18 kilometers of, of new dike and construct 20 to 30 new abato. And many of those would each require their own fish passage solution uh, and a much more complex bridge at the, at the Avon River versus what we're currently proposing is about a half kilometer of dike or upgraded causeway, one abato and one much less complicated set, set of bridges. So that, that's really the, the, the main uh, premise that went into that decision. So it, resu it results in substantially less costs overall and, and many less overall impacts uh, with this current approach. Uh, I do want to address, uh, highlight that the bridge alone does not address the primary objective of, of the project, um, being flood protection for upstream infrastructure and public safety. So that's uh, an important thing. We just want to make sure everybody understands. Uh, and the protection of upstream infrastructure is, is critical due to the Bay of Funny Tides. Uh, obviously, uh, it's one of the most extreme environments in the world. Uh, and can you compound that with climate change and sea level rise? Uh, uh, we have uh, a lot of issues here that we're trying to protect against. So the bridge options, as I mentioned, uh, uh, were much more complex uh, due to site conditions and would require an extensive new dike system along the Avon River with multiple abateau structures. Uh, in order to maintain an equivalent level of flood protection. And this had many substantial impacts from our, from our initial assessment. And this greatly expanded infrastructure footprint would require uh, extensive impacts, including along the Windsor waterfront as well. 
So uh, the assessment of the other crossing options concluded that a single new enhanced abateau with improved fish passage uh, would provide the best form of flood protection, have significantly less impacts, and was much more cost effective. And uh, I just threw this image in here. This uh, gives everybody a, a general sense of um, the amount of dike and abateau infrastructure that would be required uh, if that option were to be looked at. Um, this was produced uh, uh, by the Department of Agriculture and, and basically shows the areas where some of the historic dikes exist, where new dikes would need to be constructed and where new abateau structures would need to be, would need to be built at each of the, the tributaries in the river or at, at key drainage uh, points uh, near some of the farmland. Uh, so this, this is what the basis, uh, some of the basis of what went into uh, some of the estimates for those alternative options when they were originally considered. So CBCL was hired in 2018, actually late 2017, but the work mostly started in early 2018 to complete the overall design process for the Avon River Abateau and Causeway upgrading, uh, which is scheduled to be finalized in early 2021 or the first, first quarter of 2021. A primary focus of this design uh, over the last two years has been to, to maximize fish passage. Uh, this is a challenging environment and that being a key regulatory requirement, we've, we spent a lot of time and effort uh, going into that uh, and trying to accommodate as many fish species as possible uh, within the limitations uh, in providing flood protection. And there's been consultation uh, ongoing with the Mi'kmaq, with the public, with various groups and stakeholders, uh, such as the CLC committee, uh, as, well, as well as individual meetings. Uh, this has been gone, going through the project development. So we've been hearing lots of concerns, lots of different opinions on this project and, and requests. And we've been doing our best to uh, provide uh, what we feel is a good balanced approach uh, and provide some flexibility uh, as we move forward into the future. Uh, just uh, two more slides here, uh, and then we can open it up to a few questions before we hand it over to CVCL. Uh, so the current approach with the Abateau design, um, it was previously referred to as a, as a hybrid structure, option D. We've been trying to get away from that nomenclature a little bit uh, because what we are proposing is really a, a type of structure uh, that can operate uh, many different ways that, that all of those operational scenarios are really covered. So really, this is a very flexible design it has a, a lot of uh, capabilities built into it so they can accommodate a wide range of uh, scenarios it's also it's adaptable so um, uh, the, after the initial operating scenario if things aren't working as expected it can be adapted and changed uh, to, to meet future requirements we're making sure that components within the structure are modular or can easily be replaced or changed out in the future if it's not performing as expected. So a lot of time and effort has gone into these contingency plans just to make sure that we, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're not stuck for 75, 100 years with a structure that's not performing as well as we had expected. It will have two dedicated fishways and CBCL will touch on this a little bit more. Uh, they're a steep ass design, um, Alaska steep ass. Uh, so they'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, so we're, we're excited to, to see uh, how that functions in this environment. We, we feel confident that this type of fishway is the right solution. Uh, the Abateau design also has improved gate functionality in how it operates and, 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 and backup. Um, and initially, uh, our, our proposal uh, in our submission uh, to DFO, which is, which is coming up, uh, we are initially planning for this structure to operate under a freshwater lake scenario. So uh, we'll touch later on the various operating scenarios that this structure can accommodate, uh, but at least initially uh, we, were, uh, we feel that a freshwater lake scenario or maintaining a predominantly freshwater lake is the best approach. Uh, we feel that that uh, allows us time to see how well this structure can perform, both from a fish passage perspective as well as an overall performance perspective. Allow us to monitor fish passage and, and uh, tweak and make small changes if necessary. And, and we're, we feel we feel good that it will work, uh, but if it's if it's not working as expected, uh, we can make tweaks and a uh, slow gla gradual approach in the future is, is, is what we're planning. So we'll be doing extensive monitoring of fish passage as well as other uh, various uh, ecological factors upstream and, and monitoring how uh, the environment is changing. Um, and our uh, application to DFO is going to include a very robust monitoring plan, which will show improvements uh, 
is required to show how uh, the improvements are being made in fish passage. So our next steps in our process, um, environmental permitting. Um, so the permitting has been broken up basically into two phases. Uh, what's currently under construction on the salt marsh uh, next to the causeway was under uh, phase one uh, of permits. So that covered off um, a lot of the salt marsh impacts. Uh, but now phase two uh, is the permits that are associated with the actual abato structure itself and the remaining dike uh, infrastructure. Um, so we are planning to submit uh, a DFO Fisheries Act authorization this month. Uh, with the design that's been completed to date uh, in our application to DFO uh, to start their review process. They are the regulator that will, uh, will review and uh, um, authorize or not authorize whether this uh, structure meets, uh, meets the requirements of the Fisheries Act. And we also have uh, a wetland alteration proposal which goes through Nova Scotia environment. So those are the two major permits that are, are coming up here. And consultation uh, is going to shift to DFO uh, during the application review. Uh, most of this pertains to the consultation with uh, with First Nations, and they have a duty to consult with the McMaws. So there will be a focus there uh, during uh, their review, uh, where they will consult uh, with the Mi'kmaq on the on the design and the application. And completion of the final design plans and specifications are expected in early 2021 uh, with the completion of the design. Uh, the Abito and the bridge construction is uh, scheduled to begin in 2021, obviously pending approval of those environmental permits. Uh, and overall, uh, currently the plan is for the overall project to be complete uh, in fall 2022, again, pending approval and everything uh, continuing uh, uh, as we hope moving forward. So that does it for my portion of the update. Um, I'm going to... Uh, I guess we'll open it up here, Ken, uh, maybe before we hand it over to CBCL. And I apologize if there are specific technical questions and they're going to be covered off in CBL's, CBCL's presentation. I may, I, that may be my response, but we'll get to that in the next part. So apologies in advance. Um, but I think some of the more detailed questions may get answered uh, in that next part of the presentation. But why don't we uh, we'll open it up here first for any initial ones. Okay, Justin, well, there's a lot of questions um, that have okay. been included in the uh, chat so i'm just going to start off start off with the first ones um from darren how can you prove this structure is at end of life that would be the abato structure you've mentioned that yeah so the the current abato structure uh, is managed by the nova scotia department of agriculture um my understanding from discussions with our colleagues who's there at agriculture is that it's a it's a very tired old structure uh it's over 50 years old now uh, most structures built in that era uh, weren't designed to last much more than 50 years. Uh, there are regular inspections uh, that would be done on that type of structure. So uh, I assume a lot of the uh, engineering uh, inspections would factor into that assessment of it being at end of life. Uh, I understand there are also challenges uh, with being able to uh, maintain and inspect it just due to the nature of how it was designed. If there were no uh, real good considerations for how to properly uh, get inside that structure and maintain it safely. Uh, so that's that's one benefit of the new structure too, is a lot of that is being considered uh, in the design process. So I don't know if that completely answers the question, but uh, I'd... Uh, okay, I'll, we'll go I'll to the next on. one there, Ken. Yeah, I'll move on to the next one. That question had been uh, has been dealt with several times actually. The original abato was said to pass fish, this again from Darren, the original abato was said to pass fish as it was designed to let salt water in to pass the fish. This practice stopped when the farmers complained. Um, that was not a question, but a, a statement. Do you want to comment on that, Justin? I, I'm probably not best to comment on that. A lot of that goes back into uh, some history back in the 60s and 70s when this was built. I'm, I'm not... Uh, uh, completely up to speed on, on why some of those decisions were made at the time or what, whether that's true. So I can't really comment on that at all. Um, Gail asked what, this is back when you were talking about the flood conditions. Uh, Gail okay. asked, what, what is the flood conditions that you were basing this on? You know, those levels that you had in the graphics? Yeah, yep, yep. So a lot of that's based on uh, the, the high tide, uh, storm surge, uh, wave runup. Uh, climate change projections for sea level rise and there are various different types of models uh, for, for sea level rise projections and 
Um, if, if you're looking for a little more detail than that, uh, maybe Alex, uh, I know Alex Wilson's on the line. If there's anything there you wanted to expand on or, uh, or clarify, feel free. Alex, do you have anything to add? Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Yeah, thank you, Justin. Um, yeah, what I can do is simply just give the uh, the numbers of the different components. So uh, starting with the uh, the spring tide, which is 7.7 .7 meters, and that's from the Canadian Hydrographic Service at uh, Hansport. Then we add to that the uh, one in 100 year storm surge that brings us to 9.03. Uh, then tidal amplification, because of the shape of the estuary, the, uh, the tides actually allow the water levels to increase as they come close to the, uh, the Aboto structure and the causeway. And then we add to that wave heights and we're at 10.33. Uh, then sea level rise is uh, anywhere between 1.3 meters to uh, 3 meters. So that's where we get to in the future between 11.6 and 13.5. So those, those are the sort of uh, range of numbers we're working with for, uh, for design. So that gives a sense. The, uh, the number uh, that was in, uh, in Justin's slide there shows roughly the, uh, the top of the causeway structure. So when there's flooding, this is the, uh, the level it would be coming in at. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, Alex. Uh, Darren had asked a similar question. I think it was um, uh, addressed to, uh, can you provide your process for determining these water le level predictions. And, and that had come in at the same, same time when those graphics were show, being shown. Um, Darren had another question though. Um, do you have to provide or prove fish passage and for how many species? Yeah, so I guess the uh, main objective of this project is to provide passage for all species, as many species as possible at various stages of their life. Um, so that is that is the objective and uh, I, I would expect we're gonna have to demonstrate that, but that will ultimately be up to the DFO um, to, to assess as the regulator um, whether whether we're, we're meeting that objective or not, so. Okay, um, and Gail asked, how are you addressing the protection of Mi'kmaq rights? Right, so uh, Mi'kmaq rights are, as I mentioned, are a very important consideration in, in any infrastructure project, especially ones around waterways that could have impacts to fishing. Um, so, so in this project, uh, we've gone through uh, significant efforts, as I mentioned, over the last two years, a, a big focus of CBCL's work and modeling has been on refining uh, the fishway designs to, to create near as, as perfect as possible conditions for as many species as possible to pass. So, so given uh, the, the requirements for flood control here, uh, we are proposing fishways, uh, two of them, as I mentioned, and CBC will get more into uh, the design of those, but uh, uh, that has been a major focus in optimizing the design of those fishways to create uh, the most favorable conditions possible for as many fish species as possible. So. CBCL, I suspect we'll get a little more into that a little later and we'll probably uh, complete the answer to that question. Okay, and then from Darren, the cost to taxpayers, how much more did, there's, there's several questions um, actually about uh, costs, but we can start off with this one. Um, mm -hmm. Cost to taxpayers, how much more did option D cost to develop and build? Well, it hasn't been built yet, but I, I guess he, he's, would, I imagine he's talking about the forecast. Uh, on, mm -hmm. uh, of building, and then the previous option C developed by the expert panel. So the difference between option D and option C, I think, is essentially what he's saying. Yeah, and, and again, it's been a little while since we've been talking about these different options. So uh, I believe option C was one that worked completely passively. It was a partial tidal exchange option. So it was a structure that only operated with partial tidal exchange. Uh, the difference with that and option D was option D was kind of what we moved forward with the hybrid design, which allows it to operate under a number of different scenarios. So the two primary differences are in the Avato structure itself and the number of gates and how the gates are controlled um, and, and the fishways. Uh, we don't have an exact figure to compare the cost of those two. At least uh, I don't think we've actually, uh, we've gone that far in comparing those two costs, but I, in the grand scheme of the overall project, um, it, it wouldn't, it, I, I don't suspect it would be a, 
a huge, uh, a huge difference. Um, so when you look at the overall project involving the causeway construction, the control building, the abato is just one piece of it. And, and whether it has uh, two more gates uh, or, or slightly wider fishways, it, yes, there's a cost to that, but it's not, uh, it's not a, a, a significant uh, factor, I guess, in that. Colin, was there anything else there you'd want to add or am I fairly safe uh, oh, I think, in that response? I, I think you're, I think you're there. You know, I think, you know, the, the decision would have to be made, you know, between, you know, op, like a, option C or D, you know, the, the roots of those two are essentially both, uh, you know, created or accommodated in the, in the, in the current uh, design. Uh, the difference, the main difference is, is the gates, obviously. So, uh, you know, even, even with uh, option C or what we would call a, a tidal estuary uh, uh, water management scenario, we would still likely recommend the gates for uh, flood protection in extreme events. Okay, um, Gail had, uh, this really isn't a question, but she had typed in uh, bridges and abatoes. I think it was at the time uh, where she was, uh, uh, um, you were discussing the, you know, the, the bridges. It's the first of, of uh, a few questions about the bridge. So she said bridges and abatoes, and then she also asked shortly after, what do you mean by a less complicated bridge? I think you'd said that, Justin. Um, yeah. And yeah. So for clarification. Yeah. So, so with the current proposal and CBCL will be able to, to uh, illustrate this a little bit better in some of their upcoming slides, but we have the Avito out in front protecting the highway bridges. Uh, so because the Avito is out in front protecting the highway bridges, uh, that helps throttle down the amount of flow that comes through that Avito structure, meaning that the opening for the highway bridges doesn't need to be as wide. The bridges don't need to be as high. Um, in this current environment, the subsurface conditions, the, the bedrock and, and, and ground conditions are, are terrible. Uh, it's, it's one of the, it's a quite a challenging environment. Um, so, so as soon as you start to raise those bridges or open that span, you get into significantly more complex bridges um, if you didn't have that abato in front protecting them. So, so that's, that's what I meant by uh, less complicated bridges. Um. Uh, at, during that time when you were talking about bridges, the, long, the bridges, Darren mentioned, uh, he said bridges alone, question mark, bridges and dikes. And then, and Gail said, I would like to see a breakdown of the cost analysis for a bridge and upgraded dike system. Um, so it, it, the two are related, you know, um, and we've heard this before about um, when, the, when there was discussion about the cost analysis for a bridge um that uh well what about if it there was an upgraded dike system yeah so we we have run some high level numbers uh, uh of cost just to substantiate uh the comparison so as i mentioned 18 kilometers of dike and 20 to 30 abatos versus half a kilometer of dike or causeway here and one abato um just looking at the the, the amount of infrastructure you can you can see that the the, the latter uh is significantly less uh and then we have gone back and looked at some costs to see what that would cost uh, in comparison. And uh, yeah, we're the, the, the more complex bridge uh, with the dike system uh, right now is at least twice as much overall in cost. So um, that, uh, that uh, has been looked at and uh, not the cost is the only consideration. You got to consider long range maintenance of all that additional infrastructure as well. Uh, 18 kilometers of dike and that many abato would uh, have significantly greater uh, life cycle and long-term maintenance costs as well. Um, Gail asked if, uh, oh, sorry, I skipped one. Darren asked, um, he said, option C and bridges accommodate all species, but this option is only as many I'm going to insert species because I think that's what he meant. As you can, is this correct? Do you want me to read that again? No, no. I think I got the question. Um, I don't. I don't know that I can necessarily provide an answer to that, or confirm that, or deny it. Um, there are challenges even with the dike land system, as I mentioned. There'd be 20 to 30 abato that would be required. Many would each have their own fish passage requirement as well. 
which could be a partial uh, obstruction to some fish passage. So opening it up with the dike system uh, would still have some challenges and wouldn't open up the full habitat uh, entirely. Uh, so, so there's there's only some of the habitat of the of the main river channel that would be uh, would be made available under that scenario. And I guess I'll I'll leave it at that for now. That's uh, as best as I can answer it at this time. Uh, Colin, during the uh, presentation, um, if you guys can address that uh, at all, that would be great. Um, yep. And Gail um, says, could you explain the two dedicated fishways? I assume that's going to happen during your presentation, Colin. Yeah. Yeah, CBCL will be even much better suited to explain that. Okay, so we'll get to that, Gail. Um, uh, from Darren, has this structure been built and tested anywhere in the world? I think it's safe to say no. This is a very unique uh, environment. There are no, uh, no places like this. Uh, I know CBCL has done a lot of review of similar, uh, or trying to find similar types of structures. Colin, I don't know if there's anything you wanted to add to that, but... Uh, this is really a very unique uh, and challenging environment here. This is uh... yeah, we we've searched high and low for comparable situations across the world, um, and uh, you know we do have uh, uh, a gentleman uh, that's helping us named uh, Chris Catapotis, who is a, a world-renowned fish pest fish passage expert uh, who's worked uh, globally on, on on similar projects, and uh, we we we've. We have not been able to find one that uh, you know is is close to this one uh, at this point. You know, there's some that have similar characteristics, but not uh, not uh, not all the same challenges uh, that we're dealing with here. Okay, the next question from Darren is: Do you believe the freshwater lake scenario will pass DFO approval? Yeah, I mean, I think we're we're pretty confident that it's a, it's a significant improvement in fish passage, definitely over the existing structure, and I think some of CBCL's presentation will will further highlight that. So, um, I think we we feel confident that uh, that it's 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 a good solution, and uh, and and we're we're certainly uh, optimistic that it will uh, be approved uh, by DFO, and, uh, and and that it's the the best first uh, initial stage of operation. Um, okay, from Sonia, she said, asked, she asked rather, why did you say flood protection was not possible with a bridge or free tidal flow model when dikes could solve those issues and it is possible? Absolutely, with dikes. So, so all I was trying to do there, I know we've gotten a lot of comments, uh, emails, letters, uh, where people uh, have, have suggested bridges and with no mention of the dike infrastructure. So all I was trying to do there was uh, provide clarification for everybody that, you know, if a bridge option um, uh, were, were considered here, it wouldn't just be a bridge. It would be a bridge with uh, a full flood protection or dike lens system along the Avon River. That is the only way that we'd be able to provide a equivalent flood protection. But, but that currently isn't the project and that's not what's under consideration right now. Um, the, a follow-up question really from Sonia or, a sec, or, or sort of a B, I suppose, to that. She said, asked, also, can you please explain the difference, discrepancy in the quoted costs of dikes here versus the, the Petticodiac River in New Brunswick? Um, yeah, honestly, uh, I'm not real familiar with the Petticodiac project. I understand they're, uh, they're, they are different systems. Uh, they both have uh, their, their similarities, but also some significant differences. Uh, one in particular here, uh, is that the Avon at this location has a much greater uh, influence from the Bay of Fundy tides. Um, and because it has a greater influence here, uh, the dike infrastructure that would be required to withstand those tides is greater. So it's higher and it has a wider footprint, which means it would have higher costs. Uh, that's one of the primary differences with the Petticodiac. Uh, but I, I don't have uh, figures in front of me of what the Petticodiac costs uh, in comparison to this. Um, Jim Ivey asked, freshwater lake scenario as a priority is, contra is contradictory with the initial recommendation of option C in September of 2018. Also, is this to say no saltwater intrusion is necessary for fish passage? So maybe you can explain that freshwater lake scenario um, a bit more. 
Yeah, when we say freshwater lake, uh, really it's predominantly freshwater. Uh, there's always been a bit of leakage in the Abateau. There's been some seepage through the causeway, so it's not 100% fresh, but it's 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 predominantly fresh. Um, Sorry, I missed the first part of that question. Can you repeat that? Well, that, that's really the first part. Um, I, well, yeah. maybe, no, let me repeat it just in case, uh, just to make sure. Um, freshwater lake scenario is, as a priority, is contradic contradictory with the initial recommendation of Oxygen C in September of 2018. Yeah, so that was back around the initial options development. So those were options that were developed uh, early on. That was the, one of the first phases of the project development. And it was shortly after that, I believe in October 2018, when we went out and shared a lot of the information with the public, with the Mi'kmaq stakeholders. And that's where we gathered a lot of feedback on some of the issues, concerns, and we learned a lot more about the impacts and possible impacts that this would have on the community, uh, which helped us inform us on the appropriate approach forward. So... Um, yeah. So, so then um, I think, you know, Jim was looking at the fact it was saying freshwater. Um, so uh, he had, his second question was, all, all, is this to say no saltwater intrusion is necessary for fish passage? No, I think, uh, I think we have a, a good feeling here that, you know, having, uh, there's always going to be a little bit of a, a small brackish zone here around the structure, but uh, yeah, I don't have, think there's any indication uh, to us anyway. Uh, the current situation, obviously there is some fish passage that occurs under the current structure uh, and we feel it can continue to do so under the new structure. Uh, Colin or Alex, I don't know if there's anything further there you feel is appropriate to add. Um, I'll just add that uh, there's going to be uh, quite a bit more explained in uh, Colin's presentation. Yeah. Okay. okay. Are there many more questions? Because I just don't want us to lose the focus uh, too much here. Um, we can try to get through them here quick, uh, but I, I think CBCL's presentation will answer probably many of them. Okay. Well, there's a there's a, a, just a couple more actually. Okay. There are about three more. Um, well, first of all, Darren's asking: Are fish are First Nations happy with this proposal? Are they happy with the proposal? Um, right. That's not really for me to share, I guess, with the community uh, or with the CLC committee. Uh, we've had ongoing discussions uh, on this project with the Mi'kmaq. And uh, I, I would say uh, we're not uh, completely aligned yet. I, I'd say there's still some concerns that we're working through. and We're going to continue to engage in consulting with the Mi'kmaq and, and trying to work through some of those challenges. Um, and that's that's where we where we stand. Um, Darren had a question on the schedule. Um, were you not supposed to have this design completed in 2019 to not delay the overall project? And I guess he, he didn't ask this, but that, does the timing delay the overall project? Yeah, absolutely. We are about a year behind where we originally planned to be. And uh, a big part of that has been the concerns we've heard around fish passage and a lot of additional modeling and focus and effort going into that, uh, trying to maximize uh, fish passage on this structure. So. A lot of it has been, uh, it has been a lot of extra effort, almost a year delay, but I think it's uh, important effort that's been made to, uh, to improve, uh, to improve fish passage. So um, it's, okay. not, uh, uh, it's not wasted effort by any means. Okay. Uh, Darren asked um, if, does the flood level include the fact that the causeway restricts flow three quarters or more across the river already? I guess that's probably a question for Alexander. Yeah, Alex, uh, did you want to? Yeah, just bear with me. I'm just reading a question again. Um, include the fact that the causeway restricts flow three quarters or more. Um, the, is, is that regarding the flood map or? Yeah, because the yeah. flooding from the Bay of Fundy would, would the, the causeway wouldn't have anything to, uh, any contribution on the seaward flooding, right, Alex? Right. Yeah, so, so the flood map itself, uh, that's right, is, is made uh, with the, the existing structure uh, in place, except that the, uh, the gates uh, are just assumed in that scenario to, uh, to have been removed or just uh, kept open, uh, allowing some, uh, some tidal exchange. Um, 
right in the middle of an extreme uh, one in 100 year rainfall event. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, the whole structure would be the same except for the gate. Um, um, okay, so then the, uh, Sonia had asked, it, it said in July, Bob Pett told me consultations with First Nations were being organized for July end. Has this full consultation happened? And if so, what was their recommend, the, the uh, First Nations recommendations? Do they support construction of an abwato? Um, so I think Justin, you've already uh, said that you, there's the consultations are still ongoing and that it wasn't up to you to, uh, it wasn't uh, your place to be stating the situation and you guys are uh, still consulting and trying to iron out some, uh, some areas, is that right? That's correct. And I'll just add the consultation has been ongoing with the Mi'kmaq since 2008 on the twinning project and focused more so on the Avito and the Causeway since 2016. So there's been a lot of consultation, many meetings, uh, many times a year, I guess, uh, since that time. Okay, and uh, Jim Ivey uh, said, in an answer just provided, this is, he wrote this after he started answering uh, questions. You referenced the Abuto out in front of the highway bridges slash causeway. Does this create the potential for greater erosion on other nearby or opposing share lines? Shorelines, rather, sorry. Um. That might be better answered with one of the graphics that's going to be coming up in CBCL's presentation. We can just try to maybe hold that one and, and speak to that maybe, uh, Colin, when we get to the, uh, the uh, site overview. Okay, um, let's do that. And then uh, there's just one, it wasn't a question, but a comment uh, back to that meeting with when Minister LaFleche uh, spoke and he said that option C would only be left on the table if the group was told to consider it. Um, that, that not being a question, it's a, a statement of what uh, he had said at that time. I think we can move on now that was the end of the questions and move on to this presentation because it is uh, 10 after 7. All so, right, thank you everybody. We'll move on to CBCL then. I'll, uh, I'll stop sharing my screen here. Colin, now I'll turn it over to you. Okay, let me uh, see if I can share without too much trouble here. And Justin, perhaps you could, and I'm going to do the same, uh, turn, off, turn off the cameras because uh, sure. it turns out that um, not having so many camera on has helped with some of the uh, uh, audio. So it's all yours, Colin. Okay. Can everybody see, uh, see the presentation? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, so thank you, everyone. Um, what I'm going to do here is go through uh, a little bit of a little bit of an update on on the design process. Uh, again, I say it's presented by CBCL here to keep it simple, but uh, you know this is a you know a big team of uh, a lot of different experts and sub consultants that uh, are all contributing to the to the uh, design of this project. Um, so you know what I'm going to go through. I'm going to show a few figures of the the site overview and layout. Uh, Talk a little bit about the Abito design itself and its and and, and uh, how it relates to fish passage uh, as well, and then uh, then I'll touch base on the DFO submission, uh, additional environmental surveys, monitoring, and other permitting. So this figure is uh, you know I, I guess a, a simplified view of the overall site um, when we uh, try to show a, a single drawing to capture the whole site there's just way too many lines and you can't tell what's going on so uh, so let me see if I can get a pointer here uh, why is that not working oh there we go uh, so you can see that so and on the bottom of the screen obviously you can see the existing highway and the existing abato uh, the idea would be that this would remain except for the uh, the gates themselves and we'd probably peel back some of the downstream end uh, although the you know there are parts of uh, the upstream portions of the structure that are in good, pretty good shape the downstream end is is severely degraded and uh, you know the gates and, and, and the supporting structure are uh, are uh, you know uh, at their useful end as uh, as part of agriculture has uh, has previously stated um, the yellow represents the new twinned highway. You can kind of see how, uh, I don't remember uh, Justin's image, you could see the, the storage shed in the background and you can see how the, 
the new highway is actually going to be to the to the north of that storage shed uh, for reference. Um, you can see two uh, there's two bridges that would carry over or carry the highway over the the existing channel, and then the new channel will uh, will be diverted uh, to allow us to build uh, the new Abateau in the dry or in somewhat dry conditions. Um, and uh, uh, minimize uh, risk of problems during construction. Uh, the green represents uh, areas that you know ultimately will be uh, fairly green in the future uh, as the project uh, is finished and, and vegetation has a chance to reestablish itself. Uh, this part here is the tow berm, so it gives you a bit of perspective on where the tow berm is relative to the to the highway that we saw in the earlier images. I know somebody was asking a question about that. Um, you know, really, it's just a just the material that the highway will be built on uh, through this area is extremely soft and uh, uh, is unavoidable to uh, to uh, to build the highway without uh, major settlement and, and and slope failure issues. Um, and you can see here with the with the as we go across the new dike and reach the Abateau, um, the orange is is to represent uh, sort of the concrete structure. All of this the parts here and here will be buried. Uh, the only concrete you'll see is sort of the top edge and then the, the inside here uh, and the uh, one of the the you know more recent design uh, features that uh, you know changed from early days to where we are now is the, the structure is much shorter uh, this was a one of the big advantages of separating the abato structure from the highway itself it allowed us to go from you know 130 to 140 meters long if we were to try to do it here and then we would have problems with fitting it with the existing Abateau compared to something that's uh, uh, about 50 meters long uh, when you consider, uh, you know, from, from end to end. Um, and uh, uh, like I said, it, it's open to the sky pretty much for the entirety of it. I'll show you a bit more about that uh, in the uh, upcoming figures. And you can see here, this is the existing channel, which uh, you know, from this point forward, or from this point back, we expect to uh, uh, fill back up with sediment and establish itself as as salt marsh, uh, likely in in uh, in relatively short order. Uh, this slide's just a, a sample of uh, one of the design drawings of a sort of a zoomed in area of the Abateau. Um, uh, you can see the Abateau itself, and then there'll be a control control building and uh, an area for uh, maintenance and storage of equipment uh, related to uh, the, the 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 Abateau itself and agriculture's operations in the area. Um, the section on the bottom left is a is a section through this part of the dike. Uh, we do show a tow berm there. Uh, that's that that kind of represents what the tow berm looks like beside the highway. Although it shows it cuts off at the surface here, it's not, it's quite deep uh, and the slopes continue down uh, for some distance. Whether or not we need the tow burn here, we still, we still haven't uh, confirmed that, we, we may not, but uh, uh, we've got the space in case we need it. And these, uh, these two sections are showing uh, the river channel. So this, this section here is the river channel between the Abateau or the new Abateau and the old Abateau. Uh, it's actually quite a bit larger and wider in an effort to slow down velocities um, to uh, minimize any potential for uh, uh, scour erosion as well as to uh, uh, improve uh, the condition for fish passage and provide a, a fairly calm space for, for fish to, uh, to uh, pass through and rest as required. Uh, and then downstream, uh, this is the, the channel will look like uh, uh, for a short distance downstream, uh, we don't intend to carry uh, the uh, the uh, riprap protection that you can see here very much further um, uh, than what you can see on the plan. Uh, this is just an overview of the bridge. Um, you can see here, uh, maybe you can't read that, but it's a it's a ninety meter span. Uh, you know that's uh, uh, get, that's about the limit for you know sort of a I would call it a you know standard bridge. Uh, once we get past 90 meters, we get into much more elaborate structures uh, or multi-span structures, as uh, Justin was alluding to earlier. Um, uh, but as it is, just to keep the the channel uh, kind of at its current size, uh, in an effort to uh, keep velocities at a minimum and ensure 
uh, fish passage as well as uh, uh, provide uh, adequate flow uh, for flood protection. Uh, we didn't uh, want to go any smaller than, than what was there. Um, this is a rendering. I think Justin had the same rendering up uh, just to show uh, uh, the current uh, the current design. Uh, you can see here that essentially the lake is uh, extended up into uh, the I guess the face or the upstream face of the Abato, um, and uh, this would this would reflect either the you know, we'll get into the water management scenarios here in a little bit, but it wouldn't look a whole lot different between uh, uh, the the uh, freshwater lake scenario or the or the brackish lake scenario uh, would be very little difference in, in water elevation or, or or even color for that matter. Um, and uh, this uh, you can see this is the existing channel, just the brown at the moment, just because the resolution of the of the photo that we had wasn't that great for the channel uh, due to the tide up and down. But uh, we would expect this to uh, to fill in uh, in in time, and uh, you know it would look similar eventually to kind of what you see over on this corner all the way across, uh, unless of course a, a, a side channel uh, was to establish itself along the side of the highway like, uh, like it did in the past, uh, which is kind of another added benefit of having the tow berm where it is, it'll, it'll uh, keep it from, uh, from getting too far, jeopardizing the, uh, the highway. So uh, this slide is just intended to give sort of a, a general overview of what the Abito does and uh, what it uh, uh, what its general dimensions are. Um, the uh, the two large squares here in the middle those are the the, the main channels. Uh, we used to call them barrels, but it, it's really not a culvert anymore. They're really just openings in a in a in a in a barrier wall that uh, uh, can be open and closed with. Different types of gates. Uh, these two smaller ones up top are <coughs> intended to be an emergency overflow in case something happens with the gates. Either they get set, you know, blocked with sediment or power failure or, or something along those lines. You know, um, although it would be extremely rare uh, for for both to fail at once, they'll be independent from one another. You know, it, it is a possibility. So uh, we wanted to ensure that uh, that that uh, safety net existed. And uh, the fishways on either side uh, are uh, uh, basically the full height of the of the tide itself, from uh, from low tide to high tide, and uh, and there'll be an opening about 2.4 meters wide. And I'll, I'll get to that here more in a minute. Um, so as I indicated, you know, the flood protection really is 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 driven primarily by the main by the main gates uh, and the overflows to protect uh, protect against malfunctions. The short open structure, uh, which is better for fish, as I mentioned earlier. Um, the fishways are designed to allow two-way passage through the full tidal range. Um, and uh, the gates on all the openings um, can be operated uh, based on whatever water management scenario is, is uh, uh, decided upon for the time, either today or 50 years in the future or 100 years in the future, uh, in order to maximize fish patches and manage water levels, salinity, and sedimentation. Um, let's see if I can click on this. Need to get rid of my pointer here. Sorry, just give me a sec here. I don't know. Oh, how do you how do you stop the pointer? Uh, you have to reselect laser pointer, and then oh, there, we go. there you go. Bear with me for a moment. It'll load fairly quickly here. Um, what this is is a sort of a view into our uh, into actually our design modeling package that we use for uh, sharing the design internally for re review purposes. So this is a, a 3D view of of the Abito structure as it's currently designed. Uh, uh, Colin, you may have to uh, reshare that window. We're just seeing the presentation slides still. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. Uh, oh, I can see that there's the stop share button there. I'm just going to share again.
All right. Can everybody see that now? Yes. Perfect. So this is uh, this is our current uh, structural model. Um, so you can see this is kind of the view that I showed you before. I'm going to just look at the end so you can kind of see the the same view that I showed you on that simplified version. So uh, these are the main the main uh, the main openings. Uh, these are the overflows that I showed, and these here would be the fishways. They look like they're blocked, but they're not really. They're just uh, you know there's a few structural supports and key spots to uh, uh, allow stiffness uh, uh, in areas. And obviously, this is a very high uh, tall structures. Um, uh, we're definitely at the, at the limits of some uh, of some things here, but uh, um, yeah, a uh, couple of uh, key things uh, you can see. Like I said, uh, it's very open from the top. Uh, there will be a small bridge, uh, single lane, uh, you know, private bridge. It'll just be as, only as wide as it needs to be to pass a to pass a you know a construction vehicle likely. Uh, uh, that would go across the top uh, so that we could access uh, uh, the structure for for maintenance reasons. Uh, you can see there's a number of catwalks and things uh, that uh, are allowed to uh, facilitate inspection and and viewing of uh, of uh, of the structure and how it's operating. Uh, this area here uh, on either side would be you know basically filled with with the dike. The dike would match up to to this spot. And these slopes, and uh, eventually uh, uh, just uh, you know line up with the rest of the, the dike system. Go back to the presentation here. Am I back to the presentation? Everybody can see that okay now. Yes. Perfect. So uh, for design considerations, obviously the list is long. Um, and that's that's been you know the, the single biggest challenge here is to uh, to take all of the all all of the the considerations and, and find the best balance for all of them that we can. Uh, so you know the flood protection, fish passage, Aboriginal and treaty rights, societal impacts, uh, climate change, hundred year service life, hydrology and hydraulics. So you know tidal versus lake, sediment and salinity, and velocity. They all contribute there. Um, you know, there's, as we said, there's significant geotechnical challenges. Uh, structural is, is, is also uh, uh, not straightforward on this because of, of, the, of the size of the structure and the, and the complex environment. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, it needs to be built. And, and constructing this, if anybody is familiar with what happened when, uh, when they built the original one, how difficult it was, uh, this, uh, this won't be easy either. But uh, hopefully we've learned a lot and, uh, and uh, can... Uh, uh, Build this without any significant events. Um, so the uh, the next part that I wanted to go through uh, was to talk about the design process itself, and really at the core of the design process uh, uh, is is what we what we refer to as water management scenarios. And I just wanted to to talk a little bit about how we or why we went that way, and why we this, why it was important for us to look at uh, different ways that water can be managed through this facility. Um, the original design requirement was, uh, or one of the key original design requirements that we were faced or, uh, I guess, given was to maintain the lake. Um, uh, but one of the one of the early challenges that we found with that uh, was that one of the other key design uh, requirements was to improve fish passage. Uh, so in order to do that, you know, what with our uh, er, in our early days uh, when we were getting familiar with the project. Uh, a traditional fishway or fish ladder requires fresh water to flow from the lake to the ocean in order to allow fish to pass through it. Uh, and the problem with this was that uh, flow from the lake was required and we, we, uh, we knew early on that, um, that seasonal dry periods, uh, you know, for a, for a structure of this size uh, would result in the lake draining from time to time. Um, so, uh, in order, because of that, you know, fish passage would be would be limited at times uh, until lake levels uh, uh, could come back up because of uh, because of precipitation and, and permit outflow again. Uh, so because of that, uh, we looked at uh, you know other possible ways of operating this thing uh, in an effort to to see if we could find a, a better balance uh, 
uh, of the of the various design criteria. So through the process over the last uh, you know, many months, uh, really years at this point, uh, you know, we've advanced a, a hybrid approach, which you know started as you know option A, B, C, and D, and and really I think re what we're talking about here, uh, the the design itself is is probably uh, closest to uh, option D, but we're not really we're not really referring to it at that uh, in that in that way anymore, uh, but. Uh, it can facilitate a, a range of water management scenarios to allow for adaptive management of the system. So it has a flexible gate management system uh, and the management of the structure will be driven by flood protection and DFO fish passage requirements. Um, one of the challenges as well uh, that we've uh, been uh, thinking about and uh, studying is the fact that the ecosystem itself is, is uh, or any ecosystem, uh, are, you know, is not uh, not very tolerant of rapidly or constantly changing conditions, uh, you know, in particular uh, water, uh, the water quality. So from a salinity perspective uh, is one of the key things there. Um, so what this uh, adaptive uh, structure, I guess, provides is that, you know, allows us to start with a freshwater lake, you know, study what, what the fish passage improvements are, and then, uh, you know, if required, uh, uh, we can transition gradually to a to a, a slightly brackish lake if it's found that fish passage is inadequate. Um, and uh, you know, one of the things, one of the key things that Justin mentioned is uh, we do intend to uh, monitor fish passage. Uh, you know, once the once the structure and our facility is in place, and uh, uh, you know, continually monitor that and and uh, make changes to the operation based on that. So I don't know. This little figure on the side, uh, you know, just a, a, a nice little uh, image of what uh, what we what we mean by adaptive management. Uh, it's really uh, kind of the, the one of the principal fundamentals of, of, of the design process, where where you know you you plan something, so you assess what your needs are, design around those needs, you implement it, then you monitor it, which is the the do phase, and then uh, uh, then you learn from that. Uh, Evaluate what you're seeing, and then adjust your 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 uh, approach, and then you back get back into the assessment of design to solve those problems. So that's that's really what we're talking about as far as an adaptive adaptive system. So the first water management scenario uh, that uh, Justin had indicated that that uh, will be uh, will be presented to DFO is uh, is a freshwater uh, the, the freshwater lake scenario so the, the focus of this scenario was to maintain the lake level uh, close to what it is now uh, with no tidal influx while maximizing fish passage um, so you can see the image over on the right which is uh, you know basically the, the the lake level as it is now uh, you get two-way fish passage uh, but uh, it would have to be closed at high tide, or when the, when the tide was higher than the lake level. So that's, I think, it works out to be, uh, you know, on average, about 37% of the time. Um, and uh, you'd be able to open the fishway gates when there's enough water available in the lake. Um, but at times uh, when there's uh, not a lot of rainfall or uh, you know, issues uh, with with that, uh, you know, there would be there would be times when uh, when you'd have to close the gates to maintain the lake level. Uh, with this option, obviously tidal influx is, is eliminated, so you know that that eliminates uh, or all but eliminates uh, you know, salinity and sediment. Uh, you know there, there there may be a bit of leakage, uh, you know maybe a little more initially, and then as time goes on, uh, uh, less uh, that like what was seen in the existing causeway. But uh, uh, we don't expect uh, we don't expect to see, uh, to see much leakage if any. Uh, there's more freshwater habitat uh, with this option. Uh, you know it's quite stable um, based on on our, our our work so far uh with the with the fresh water option compared to a, a the brackish uh option we're looking at about uh, if we went to the brackish option we would reduce the freshwater habitat by about 25 percent in the in, in the overall system and uh you know with this option obviously you'd have some water quality degradation in the warmer months um, but uh, you know the, the the thing that 
that Justin did explain here, uh, you know, we do see this as, as, as likely the, the, the lowest risk initial approach, uh, uh, you know, for, for all those factors. So this slide uh, is uh, um, a slide that shows what a typical year would look like uh, from, I guess, a water availability perspective. So uh, I first want to say that, you know, this is based on the year 2008. Uh, we selected 2008 because we had about 30 years of, of rainfall data uh, for this area. And uh, we, we select 2008 because of it. It was, it was typical in terms of the, the total rainfall over those 30 years of data. Now, if you look at the, if you look at the, the, the bars, the blue bars in the bottom, you'll see how they kind of go up and down. That's sort of indicative of the amount of, that, that's indicative of the amount of uh, uh, inflow or stormwater that, that does come into the lake. You know, there are some odd things, you know, this year, August was, uh, was obviously a little more wet than typical. You know, typical for August, you'd probably actually see it being one of the lower months. But you know, uh, generally, uh, you know, this shows that uh, uh, you know, there is a, a fairly uh, significant amount of time that the fishways would be open. So that that's what these bars represent. So the blue bar represents how much time we would expect the fishways to be open, uh, up to the maximum possible time being the red line. Uh, which would be where uh, the lake uh, is uh, no longer higher than the tide. So that's when the gates would close and, uh, and the fishways wouldn't be open. The, uh, the small orange block uh, at the bottom is intended to represent the, the current operation of uh, allowing, that it basically represents 20 minutes per tide uh, of uh, what's happening now or it happened this summer. I think as of recently maybe uh, has been changed, but uh, I think it's been uh, in, uh, uh, ongoing efforts to uh, to uh, keep that going as long as we can. So uh, one of the key things, like I said, is uh, you know it, it will this will vary annually. It's not going to be always this shape uh, year in year out. Depending on on rainfall, it will it will change. The, uh, the next water management scenario uh, is the Brackish Lake scenario. So the focus for this scenario uh, is to maintain the lake level uh, while maximizing fish passage. So the, the, the criteria of, of eliminating uh, salinity and, and sediment uh, is, is, not, uh, is not included in this one. So uh, what this does is uh, it does allow two-way fish passage and, and the fishways would, would essentially be always open. Uh, the only time that they would be closed would be, like I said uh, earlier, in times where maybe there was a an extreme event, uh, uh, either a you know a hurricane or you know a major major event where where we wanted to uh, prevent ingress of, of tidal water uh, into the lake. Uh, uh, so what this what this scenario allows is is some tidal water to enter the lake, uh, creating a small tide of approximately one to two feet. Um, so what this does is it allows the fishways to be open all the time, so uh, you know fish can pass back and forth, uh, you know as uh, as velocities and and their desires and their behaviors uh, require. Um, so with this option, you have some ingress of sediment salinity, uh, but it's a, it's it, it would be variable. Uh, uh, the three primary factors that would contribute to that: uh, one would be the distance of whatever point you're looking at, which would be upstream from the abato. Uh, the second uh, point or the second input to that would be the amount of stormwater runoff you have. And the third factor there are the tides. So the image you can see over on the right kind of demonstrates that. Um, this, uh, this image here shows that uh, as far as the sedimentation and the plume that you would see uh, from, uh, from the tidal influx would end here and it would sort of flush back and forth. This is under the uh, the brackish scenario under a, a flood tide. So as it, under the ebb tide, you can see, you know, it carries itself back out. <clears throat> one, uh, you know, one of the key things uh, that I think uh, uh, is, uh, uh, you know, of, of interest to to people in the room is is the idea of, of how far the salinity will go upstream. And uh, you know, I think one of the things that uh, that's important to remember is that uh, 
you know, when, when there are dry conditions uh, without a whole lot of water coming down the river to, to, you know, continue to move water out to the Bay of Fundy, uh, the salinity would have a chance to creep upstream, but this would be, you know, limited to, to the drier months uh, of the year. Uh, we wouldn't expect it to be a, a, a long-term issue on an annual basis. Um, the, uh, and, and the other part of the, the design is that, uh, you know, with it being an adaptive uh, management program, uh, the, uh, the gates can be controlled to adjust the tidal ingress and associated salinity and sediment, uh, you know, based on, on, on what measurements will be of the, of the monitoring program. Um, so the, you know, one of the, one of the, the other key points of this is that it is a, it would be a, a more natural ecosystem, although it, it will be dynamic. Uh, like I mentioned with, with salinity and sediment, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, more, more uh, uh, variable by mother nature and, uh, you know, there'll be, uh, uh, you know, periods of time, like I said, where, where, you know, some, some things will be, uh, uh, you know, I guess salinity will be higher than others, but uh, um, uh, the other part of that is that you have, uh, like I said earlier, about 25% less uh, freshwater habitat. You can see here uh, the upper image uh, that's shown here is uh, what it would look like at low tide. Like I said, the tide for this scenario is where we'd only be talking a foot or two, which really is not a whole lot different than the freshwater lake uh, scenario uh, with respect to uh, allowing lit water to flow from the lake through the fishway. Uh, you know, we would expect a, a foot or two variation in, in the lake level uh, with, with the freshwater lake scenario as well, particularly in, in times when there's uh, a lot of rainfall. And the third, uh, the third scenario uh, would be the, the damp and tidal estuary. Uh, so this, uh, this scenario uh, is intended to be uh, one that would maximize this fish passage uh, and would result in, in a passive operation. Uh, so, you know, most of the, the, the things here are similar to the, uh, to the brackish lake, except for the, the tidal range. Uh, so in this scenario, uh, we have two-way fish passage uh, again, and they're almost always open, with the exception of, uh, of uh, you know, uh, some extreme events that maybe decided to close them. Uh, there would be passive flat gates on the main channel, including the overflows. There'd be sort of smaller ones on the on the overflows, uh, but the roller gates. I think you know, they they. I say no roller gates here, but uh, you know, I think. Uh, we would likely still want them there uh, for uh, you know extreme events and, and maintenance reasons. Um, uh, this uh, this particular scenario would, would have a, a reduced tidal range in the lake compared to uh, what you'd see on the Bay of Fundy, but uh, but it is the the the, the largest uh, tide that you would see uh, of the three scenarios. And uh, what this would result in is a is a brackish environment, including you know, mud flats and salt marsh. And you can see the, the images on the, on the right of, of what, uh, what, this, uh, what this scenario would look like. Um, and similar to the, the previous, you'd have some ingress of sediment and salinity, uh, you know, likely more than what you'd see with the, uh, with the brackish lake. Uh, although again, it would depend on the time of the year. Um, and uh, uh, like I said before, the gates, they can be controlled to protect against flooding and, uh, and adjust the, the tide range and the sediment salinity. So, you know, even with the, with the passive gate, the passive gates could be adjusted in their position to allow, uh, you know, a certain amount of control over the flood, uh, over the, I guess, the, the tidal range, uh, because they would let a little bit more or less water in on the incoming tide. Uh, so it can be sort of tuned to, uh, to uh, you know, meet, uh, meet uh, you know, uh, I guess stakeholder uh, rights holder requirements. Um, so the next uh, the next part I want to talk about a little bit was the the fish weight itself. Um, now one of the things I didn't mention earlier uh, that I think is important uh, with the with the structure itself, you probably noticed that the the fish weights are just uh, they're shown as sort of plain uh, you know wide open tall skinny uh, openings uh, with no uh, baffles or any kind of structure uh, inside of them, but uh, but that's not the case. Um, it's just uh, they're just not shown in there right now, and, and we're we're working on refining that design as we speak. Um, so what we did look at uh, for the for the fishway itself is we looked at uh, sort of the traditional uh, pool and weir fishways or vertical slot fishways. Um, 
the uh, the one you see on the top here would be uh, would be a vertical uh, or sorry a pool and weir fishway. Uh, this is in uh, in Dartmouth. Uh, but the problem with these uh, in this in this environment is is they would be prone to sedimentation. Uh, plus, they don't really work uh, in uh, in in both directions very well. So, uh, because of those uh, uh, items, uh, uh, they were uh, they were eliminated from from contention. And then we were looking at uh, uh, a denial uh, type fishway, uh, and then the Alaskan steep pass is like a, a subcategory of this, which is what you see on, on the right hand side uh, at the bottom of the screen. Uh, so basically, what it has is uh, uh, plates that are angled. Uh, that extend out from the side of the of the of the fishway themselves, or from the uh, and and then they kind of stick into the water and, and divert the water in a way that uh, you know in some places you actually get uh, get reverse flow uh, within the fishway to uh, to keep velocities at uh, at a a reasonable level for for fish passage. Um, so, like I said, the Daniel or Alaska Steep Pass Fishway, they they have the ability to function in two directions. Uh, use the they'll use the tidal water to pass fish, and therefore uh, you can stay open for the entire cycle or the entire tidal cycle if 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 that is the uh, the mode of operation. Um, it re they regulate water velocities such that the lowest velocities are at the surface, uh, which is ideal for fish passage in this environment. Uh, we understand the majority of the, the fish species. Uh, prefer to to travel uh, near the surface uh, here, but uh, uh, not too close so that uh, so that uh, uh, predators uh, can't pluck them out of the water. Uh, and and the uh, the other advantage of this is there are higher velocities near the bottom, uh, which uh, uh, creates uh, an environment that uh, that sediment uh, uh, will not uh, like to settle in, which is a, another big issue that uh, that we want to avoid. Um, and uh, you know, through the through the fishway design, uh, you know there there are there are opportunities as well to uh, to utilize the the, the main gates uh, to allow a window of time to open for all species to pass as velocities permit. Sort of similar to what they're doing now, uh, but uh, uh, you know it depends on which scenario you're looking at, and you know there are there are uh, disadvantages to doing that as well. For example, in the, in the freshwater lake scenario, if you did that, uh, you know you are you, you could be reducing the amount of water available uh, for the fishways to operate uh, in time uh, because if the main gates are open a little bit more water can can flow out. Um, so when we're when we're going through the design of the fish uh, fishways themselves, uh, the swimming behavior and requirements of, of fish uh, you know are affected by species, age class, Body shape and size, group behavior, and level of fatigue. So that's that's what uh, this figure here is intended to represent. Um, it's a, it's a little hard to figure out. I, I still struggle with it a little bit. But uh, you know, basically, this is, this is actually for a salmon, so our Atlantic salmon. So what this is saying, uh, you know, for example, um, you know, these these bands of of lines here indicate. Uh, you know what the, the percentage of success or predicted success that fish would pass, and then uh, uh, this would be the velocity, and this would be the distance that they could go. So, uh, say this is the 75% line. So, this what this point here is saying is that uh, for a uh, like it's a 45 to 50 meter distance, uh, a salmon could swim uh, at one meter per second uh, uh, with a you know a 75% success rate. Um, so, with these, with this, with this information, what we do is we take our model, uh, which I'll show a little bit more information here in a minute, uh, and estimate what we expect the velocities to be within the fishway itself. Uh, and that's what this image over here on the on the right hand side is is indicating. Uh, you can see here. So basically, everything blue and purple is, is a half meter per second or slower. Uh, in some cases, it's actually backwards flow. Uh, up to yellow is within about a meter per second, and then past that you get up into you know, one to even up to close to three meters per second uh, uh, as you get closer to the bottom. Uh, and then we, what we do is we take these and we, uh, you know, fit each species at each stage in the tide to estimate what we think the success rate will be. So, like I said, that's what we're going through now. Uh, this is a, a preliminary example of what we expect. 
uh, salmon passage to be uh, through the current design uh, with the freshwater scenario. So the green, the green time from uh, you know what we call as minus six through to about two, and those are all in terms of hours would be uh, available for fish passage. And then this four hour stretch when the tide is above uh, the lake is when the gate would have to close. Uh, and obviously salmon wouldn't be able to pass at that time, but then on the downturn and start all over again. You know, so I think key, key things that we're looking at when we're, when we're making these uh, decisions uh, and uh, uh, analyzing what we expect the success rates to be or efficiency and effectiveness. Um, you know, we're looking at velocity, we're looking at flow patterns, including attraction flows at the inlet and outlet of the, of the fishways themselves. Uh, we're looking at uh, the passage width relative to, to fish size, same thing with height uh, and depth and, and cover, and then the timing, you know, behavior is a big part of this, as understanding when, when the fish want to pass, uh, because not every fish wants to pass at the same time or under the same condition. And uh, this is just a quick, uh, a quick chart that uh, demonstrates how uh, we, have, we have 22 different species uh, that we are uh, aware of uh, based on uh, data that we've uh, received through the course of the project. And you can see the, the various uh, requirements, uh, you know, arrows indicating upstream or downstream migration, um, and then the, the lines indicating sort of the reason uh, uh, for being uh, in or for wanting to pass, whether it be spawning or foraging or, or both, I think, uh, in some cases. Um, and then uh, the kind of split between adult and juvenile uh, where, uh, where relevant. Um, so this is, a, this is a video of our, of our model of the Abato and the fishways. I'm gonna get this, oh, what's going on here? So I clicked the wrong spot. Don't click the play button. So you're gonna see, this is gonna change a little bit. So what the, you can see the, the blue represents generally quiet water, uh, you know, below two meters per second. Uh, and the red and the green represent fast water. Uh, one, you're gonna see the model change here in a little bit. One of, the, one of the design issues or considerations we had here was, you know, ensuring that uh, uh, fish that were approaching the fishway uh, from the upstream end had, uh, you know, a, quiet area to enter the fishway and not get sucked into the main flow. So you can see here, um, the models actually changed to, uh, to another alternative where we've extended these interior walls out to ensure that there's a, a large area without any drastic changes for fish to be able to travel back and forth. Um, so anyway, just let that play for a minute. It does switch again here to show sort of a cutaway view uh, of what, uh, of what it looks like from a slightly different perspective. Colin, it may just be worth clarifying that this uh, this represents the flow of water through the abato. So the abato structure is actually peeled back in a way, so you could just see how the water yeah. the yes. and the and the fishways on the other side. Uh, let's see here. It just keeps going like that. So I'm just going to move on to the next one here. Um, so uh, next thing I want to talk about was uh, the environmental permitting requirements that we're going through right now. So you know, the key, the key regula regulators are, are Nova Scotia environment for obviously wetland, uh, wetland alteration, uh, DFOs in terms of fish, uh, Department of Lands and Forests, uh, in terms of works on submerged crown lands uh, where there's salt water and then uh, uh, Transport Canada uh, is also uh, is also uh, required to weigh in on the project um, and uh, you know one of the one of the key things obviously uh, for, for the project is to understand uh, sort of the before and after conditions um, so there's been a lot of a lot of studies done over the past many years uh, uh, by us and, and by others, uh, you know we we've done uh, fish habitat assessments uh, uh, as part of uh, the phase one uh, the phase one work. Uh, 
there's been vegetation assessments uh, in 2019 to understand uh, what the what it looked like before uh, before uh, we started all this work. Uh, we've done uh, quite a bit of water quality monitoring. We've, we've got a, a groundwater monitoring program underway, which I'm sure uh, uh, some of you have, uh, have heard about. Um, uh, there's been wetland monitoring ongoing. That's that's being done by others. Um, there's been uh, quite a bit of fish presence monitoring done uh, uh, for for many years. I'm not actually. I think it's probably even before May 2017. Uh, now that I see that, and and, uh, and it is ongoing. Uh, and uh, what we're planning now uh, is uh, is what uh, what a fish passage monitoring program would look like. Uh, we understand it'll be a requirement of of, of DFO. Uh, so we're uh, we're building a plan now uh, uh, of what that could look like. Uh, uh, not necessarily uh, uh, how it, or who would be doing it, but what uh, what it is we need to do. Um, so a little bit more detail on the post-construction fish, fish passage monitoring program. Like I said, it's under development. Uh, you know, the key aspects of it is is uh, is the data collection. So you know, what if what do we need to collect so we can have a, a, a reasonable before and after comparison? Uh, what does sample, sampling timing, uh, locations, and methods look like? Uh, and then uh, all that uh, all that has to add up to uh, being able to assess what the what the effectiveness and, and efficiencies are. So uh, you know the effectiveness being the you know confirmation that the fish species requiring passage can pass, and, and efficiency being uh, basically how many fish need to pass in order to fully utilize the available habitat upstream. Um, and uh, you know, part of that is confirming entrance conditions and cues are suitable for fish that want to pass. Um, so uh, I, guess the I think this is the last, last part before we get to questions, uh, just a, a quick uh, summary of what we're, or what TIR is working on for offsetting projects. Uh, uh, CBUS and TIR have developed a, a few offsetting projects uh, for the compensation for, for loss of wetland and fish habitat, and those are those include uh, the Truro Onzo Salt Marsh, uh, the St. Croix River uh, High Salt Marsh, and tidal wetland restoration, and then uh, Mavalette Tidal uh, Wetland Restoration Project. Uh, and these habitat, uh, the habitat developed uh, includes tidal wetland and river floodplain habitat, uh, including salt marsh, brackish, and, and tidal tidal and freshwater wetland, uh, and tidal and freshwater river habitat. And that is the end of what I have. Thanks, uh, Colin. Um, folks, it's uh, four minutes to eight, and we have a lot of questions. Um, so I'm going to suggest that we uh, keep this meeting going until at least uh, 8.30. Um, all right, so uh, let me start off at the top there. Um, sorry, I scrolled too far, scrolled up too far. Oh, here we go. Okay, so there's a few uh, questions that are similar and where they are similar, I'm just going to try and uh, um, uh, ask the question once. Um, the first one by, from Darren though was, uh, would it be safe to say that if this hasn't been done anywhere, any, been done elsewhere, that TIR has no idea if it will provide effective and efficient fish, fish passage for all species all year? Maybe I'll just jump in there first and then call on if you want to add to that. Um, so we say there, there's nothing like this elsewhere. There's nothing exactly like this. Uh, elsewhere in the world. I, I think there are components of this, uh, as Colin touched on, that are similar, and there's lessons learned from those that we can apply in this case, but uh, uh, there's nowhere specifically exactly like the conditions here. So, uh, and, and with that, that's part of the uh, the engineering and design process and, and the modeling and the analysis that, that goes into uh, the work CVCL is doing. Um, there's a lot of ways that you can, you can uh, do predict things on a realistic basis and, and, and apply it to the structure. And, and then that's also part of the monitoring and, uh, and testing to confirm the model assumptions and, and uh, adapting in the future as required. So uh, hopefully that kind of generally answers it. And Colin, if there's anything you want to add, feel free. Yeah, I mean, you know, that, that is part of the design process. You know, sure, there isn't one, like you say, one specific uh, uh, 
facility that does the same thing uh, or you know all the same things. But you know we there's you know, there's a reason why we have you know local and, and global experts on the team. Uh, you know to take all the knowledge that we have as a team and and come up with uh, with with a solution that we think will work. Uh, you know that's through you know modeling. Uh, you know, literature, research, uh, you know, experience, uh, uh, you know, the, just like anything, you know, they're, 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 you know, most problems are, are, are solvable if you have the, uh, the correct input to, to, uh, to work with. And, uh, you know, I think uh, our team has, uh, has done everything they can to, uh, to uh, research and investigate and study and, uh, and, uh, uh, design something that we, we believe will will work. Yeah. Um, maybe I'll just add a, a little bit to that. <clears throat> we sure we've done we're trying to do everything we can, but uh, it's also understood that uh, there's uncertainty and we're certainly not 100% sure. That's why there's a, a very comprehensive monitoring plan, and that the structure is also intended to be adaptive. So, you know we. We have some confidence uh, about the efficiency, but at the end of the day, the monitoring will tell what's actually going on and the structure will be able to adapt to whatever is needed here to make sure that um, you know, all the requirements are met. Um, Darren asked, the design being shorter and open to the sky, was that done to assist with potential fish passage? Yes. Um, there's a, there's several questions, um, that are, relate to the commercial fishery. Um, Darren asked the first one and it's, uh, is TIR aware that this, that the area this abateau is being built on directly affects, affects the commercial fishery that fishes on this, the exact spot of this build? Yeah, so uh, I'll speak to that. Um, uh, we, we were made aware of that uh, through after the project development and after this option was uh, developed. Uh, this option, uh, as, as shown here on, on the screen, uh, was based on a number of considerations uh, that that wasn't uh, something uh, that was considered in the selection of this this location, something we found out, I guess, after the fact. Uh, but but uh, as with any impacts, uh, there 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 will be a process to go through and, and deal with impacts to 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 uh, uh, those groups or individuals, landowners, anything that would uh, be impacted by the project. So as the details are, are finalized here and uh, the final uh, impacts are known, uh, uh, there would be a process uh, in, uh, in in working through that uh, uh, those affected. Well, I guess that's an answer to this next question, but I'm going to ask it anyways from the, uh, for the record, it's Gail asking, yes, how is this government going to accommodate the commercial fishery that will be basically shut down because of the Abwato location? Yeah, so I don't think I can necessarily answer that um, right now, uh, but uh, that's something that uh, I'm sure will uh, be a continued dialogue uh, with, with those impacted by the project. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, Sonia. No, sorry. I knew there was another question from Gail there. Gail asked, um, is the narrow opening of the Abwato going to create a bottleneck that will create a water force that fish will not like? The current design, that, that's, one of the, that's one of the things that we're, we're designing to not happen. Uh, that's what uh, uh, all the the modeling is that we've been doing is to uh, ensure that uh, uh, there aren't areas where uh, where there's uh, barriers to fish passage. Um, I'm going to jump down a bit just because Gail asked another question having to do with design, and uh, she asked, "What will the inside of the structure be like for fish passage? Smooth, jagged, etc." It'll be, I mean, obviously there's going to be, uh, you know, there's going to be baffles that uh, that protrude out into the fishway, but uh, the the spacing between between the baffles, I think. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Alex, but uh, I think we're at 1.4 meters wide between the baffles. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. And and they're actually 
they're they're quite angled, so they're they're kind of almost tucked out of the way a, a fair bit. Um, uh, so no, the the opening will be the the, the fish passageway uh, again is. You know, through the design process, as I as I indicated, uh, you know, on one of the slides here with uh, with a, a bit of a, an image of what uh, what water velocities look like, and I think uh, the uh, um, the uh, um, animation that we showed uh, kind of shows what uh, what the water itself uh, will look like going through the fishway. Sonia asked a question. Um, will the new bridges meet the standard of free tri f excuse me of free tidal flow? Should this test Aboiteau fail and have to be removed? The, the bridge the bridge is not intended to uh, stand on its own without the Aboiteau. It's a it's a it's a I, I call it a facility uh, between the various parts uh, between the Aboiteau, the bridge, and the highway. Yeah, and just to add to that, I mean, both structures are being engineered and designed with various factors of safety and 100-year uh, service life. So, so both pieces of infrastructure are going to be uh, very robust, and uh, we wouldn't expect either to, uh, uh, to fail. Um, and, and it follows that systems approach that uh, I mentioned earlier in our, our part of the presentation. Um, I, I believe that uh, what Sonia was getting at was not so much a like you know a structural failure of the Aboiteau, but if the the um, when the Aboiteau was tested after being put in use, that it failed the test and it had to be removed. Yeah, so we have no reason to believe that it would have to be removed. Uh, but uh, if we want to be hypothetical, uh, under our extreme worst case scenario, if the gates were removed from the Aboiteau and it was uh, uh, tidal water was able to flow back and forth freely uh, through basically a, uh, a large double culvert, uh, which is what this would kind of probably be, be like, Colin. Um, the bridges would be able to withstand that. I, I think that's safe to say, is it not? It, they could. I mean, we, we yeah. could, uh, there, there'd be some some risks presented by it. Uh, you know, the the the, the clearance, uh, you know, from extreme events uh, to the underside of the bridge would uh, would would be. Uh, a little tighter, or more, more, a little closer. The the a little close for comfort, maybe is a is a way to put it. But you know, the, we wouldn't expect them to fall down or or, or be an issue. Um, during the uh, when you Colin, you were showing the three D design. Darren asked, or you mentioned actually um, the, the phrase "nearing limits of things." That you know, so we're we're meeting the limits. We're nearing the limits of things. He wants to know which limits are nearly reached. Um, yeah, I, the it's just the, the the it's just a big structure. You know, there, there's you know very tall very tall retaining uh, walls that are part of the structure. Um, and uh, you know, I guess it's just not it's not conventional. Um, so uh, you know, it's a it's a it's a fairly complex structural design. Um, so you know, it's not it's not that we uh, we we can't uh, you know design solutions for these issues. It's just a matter of uh, of doing the work and uh, and figuring out what the solutions are. Um, you know, it's it's just. You know, for example, on the back side of, of, of the fishways, uh, you know, we have these counterforts added to, to uh, you know, a typical retaining wall. So it's not really, it's, it's not really, uh, I probably shouldn't have used that term. It, it's not really the, 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 the accurate way to put it. It's just, it's just not a standard design. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's unique and, and complicated. Um. Darren asked, oh, sorry, Jim Ivey asked, uh, again, in the 3D view, he said, you referenced that the fishways were open, not blocked. Did I understand correctly? Is it they're permanently open? Uh, no, what I, what I was referring to was that from, from the top. So this is the, the top view here. Sorry, I went a little bit too far. So from the top, what I meant is that the, they're open to the sky. Uh, uh, the fishways... Uh, so as the water flows through and the fish want to, want to travel through, uh, it's, no, it's known that, that fish don't like going through long, dark uh, tunnels, like, a, like a, a very long culvert. There's limitations on those. So, um, you know, it was a, it was a, a, design, uh, a design decision that we made to, uh, uh, you know, as part of shortening this, we could, we could provide that, uh, 
that, uh, or uh, I guess eliminate that potential barrier to, to fish passage by doing that. Yeah, one other way to explain that column might be like, it's like two open channels along the side uh, rather than uh, two pipes or culverts. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so from Darren, uh, who gave you the requirement to maintain the lake and what does that have to do with fish passage in commercial fishery and in indigenous rights? So I'm going to stop there. there. It's a longer question, but there's several parts to it. So I'll stop, stop there first. Do you want me to read that again? Uh, well, I think, uh, I think the first part I've got, um, the, the design requirement to maintain the lake was, was part of the scope that we were given uh, as a design team to, to take on. Yeah, and just to add to that, I think when, when the project was first scoped and the RFP was put out to a consultant to you know, help TIR and agriculture find a solution here, uh, we didn't have a full understanding of the fish passage challenges associated with that. So, uh, you know, it was, it was our full intent to, uh, you know, try to maintain a lake and the status quo if at all possible. So that was, that was the starting point. And it was as we got further into the design process and had a CBCL and their, their uh, team on board that we, we understood those fish passage challenges uh, a bit more. That's why we hired out that expertise. So his second part, the second part of Darren's question is given this, you know, they're given this requirement to maintain the lake. Um, why did that take precedent over the commercial fishery that fish were, that, that fish were, that, no, sorry, over the fishery that fish where this abato is supposed to be built and will remove the ability for the commercial fishermen to continue to make a living? Sorry, I'm just digesting that question. Um, I, 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 I think a, a shorter way of saying it, it asking the question is um, this requirement to um, to, to re retain the lake, why did that take precedence over the commercial fishery? I don't I don't know that it did. I, I kind of see them as two different issues. Um, uh, unless I'm not following the question, but you know, we're, we're trying to find a balanced solution here, obviously, uh, uh, before uh, um, we're trying to understand uh, all the impacts here, but also not uh, make a, we don't feel it's appropriate to make a drastic change uh, before understanding how well this can perform and how well it can pass fish uh, with the lake uh, still in place. Sonia asks, what kind of temperature and salinity gradient are you creating for fish who are passing with your freshwater model? And doesn't this mean you'll be closing the gate just as certain species will be trying to achieve fish passage? Alex, did you want to take that one? Uh, I, I can try. Um, so uh, I'll just explain how I understand the question. I think it means that um, as the, um, because there's a, there's a very strong gradient between the fresh water lake and the saline tide, some fish don't want to to cross and move upstream into the lake just because it's, uh, there's too much of a change. And I think uh, the question says that therefore the fish will try to move just as the tide comes closer to the lake level and there's less of a gradient and will want to pass at that time. And therefore uh, this will come very close to the time when the gates uh, would close. So, meaning that if, if effectively uh, it, it's going to be very difficult for those fish that are looking for, um, you know, a smoother transition, a smoother saline transition uh, to pass. Um, so, uh, our, uh, you know, we have the, uh, so some local and, and international experts uh, on, on fish uh, and their behavior. And uh, their uh, explanations was that um, uh, most most fish species are, are able to uh, to tolerate a fairly sharp um, salinity gradient, even in a um, in a natural environment. When the tide rises, it, it rises directly against the fresh water, and some fish just naturally go from a, a very salty uh, environment to a very fresh environment just uh, just because sometimes there's little space for that water to mix and the gradient is quite sharp. 
Um, but, uh, you know, in, in this uh, proposed system, there would be a little bit of a brackish uh, environment just in front of the, on both sides of the, uh, of the structure. So it would be somewhat sharp, but, um, but you know, in, in the big scheme of things, uh, there's certainly going to be a sharper gradient with a freshwater option than the brackish or even the, uh, the tidal, uh, damp and tidal estuary. So um, that goes back to the behavior of certain fish and there's always some uncertainty there. So that's, that's the best <laughs> to answer this question. Another part to that as well, and I'll add to that, experts are advising us is that you know the, the, the because the gates will be would be closed for about a period of four hours but the, it's our understanding uh, that uh, the fish will actually wait uh, and uh, you know, they'll 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 wait for the conditions to to improve again uh, which uh, would be you know four hours away and then they'd have the same condition as the lake and, and tide are, are the same uh, and have another opportunity to pass through uh, well, Darren asks is, um, a question about uh, availability of water. He says, in the expert panel in 2017, they identified there was not enough water to supply fish ladders 365 days a year. Are you leading us to believe this panel was wrong? No, that we no. Said th we've, we've said the same thing. Yeah, I think uh, Colin went over that with his graph on the freshwater scenario showing the uh, the percentage of time that, that freshwater would be available uh, to feed the fishways. And it, it isn't 100% of the time. Uh, in, in fact, it's it's uh, the maximum is the 66% bar there and everything between the blue bar and that line uh, would represent where there isn't sufficient or enough water to uh, feed the fishways. So that would be um, probably consistent with our statement back at that time. This uh, his next question, this option will not provide the fish passage that option C or bridges would. And, and so lake level took precedent over fish passage. I, I would uh, say. It, no, go ahead, Colin. Yeah, yeah generally, generally uh, the, the freshwater lake would, uh, the freshwater lake scenario would not allow uh, the same opportunities for fish to pass. Um, yeah, in, in either of those scenarios, uh, we would expect the fish wait to be open all the time. Uh, and uh, fish can pass when, uh, when conditions are correct for, for them. That being said, though, the graph shown here uh, shows uh, quite a significant improvement in terms of uh, available time. Uh, the fish will have to pass under the freshwater scenario compared to the existing structure. So, uh, you know, I think this this demonstrates that this uh, uh, even under the freshwater scenario is is quite a big improvement over the existing structure that's there now, and the twenty minute up to twenty minute openings. Um, you must have used uh, Colin. I don't recall it, but you must have used the phrase "lowest risk initial approach" because uh, Darren's saying "lowest risk initial approach" for what? I think for, uh, in terms of, of um, shifting from what's there now to what the next, uh, I guess, regime will be. Uh, going from the current scenario uh, that's there now as an example or an extreme example to the, to the, the tidal estuary would be a, a significant shift in, in salinity levels and, uh, and then in turn vegetation and even fish, fish populations and types, uh, you know, the, the freshwater lake, for example, provides much different habitat and conditions, uh, you know, so the, the, you know, certain fish are going to be happier in one versus the other. So, you know, whether, whether, you know, one is better than the other, uh, you know, it's a, I guess, uh, it's, it's what lens you're looking through, I suppose, from, a, you know, which fish are better than others, uh, for example, you know, with, with the freshwater lake scenario, we, you have more gas grow spawning habitat, as an example. Um, that's where the freshwater freshwater habitat comes into play. Uh, Jim, Izy, uh, Jim Ivy asked, rather, um, perhaps I misunderstood, but you referenced the gates being open 63% plus or minus and, and closed 37% of the time. Sorry, but six, a slot six, six, uh, yeah. 
Okay, well, okay. Plus, yeah. uh, but a slide thereafter, thereafter reference to a fish passage, but with no title exchange. How? Can you explain that? Um, I don't quite understand the second part. Can you? Can you say that? Sure. Yeah, so your 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 previous slide, Colin, uh, indicated that the the there would be two way fish passage with the freshwater lake. I think right. that's referring to the design of the structure. It's able to allow well, two-way no, fish passes, correct? Fish can go both ways. Yeah. It's not, not in terms of water. Is that, is that a question? Uh, Jim, Jim, you can uh, just add to the chat if that answered your question or not. And, um, all right, Darren, to everyone, CVCL, to my understanding, around 2018, the sediment depth uh, of the reservoir portion was measured. Has CVCL or TIR determined how much sediment has been deposited upstream from above the causeway over the last 48, year, 48 years? We don't have that information. Um, the next one, if the Department of, this again from Darren, if the Department of Agriculture is willfully violating the Fisheries Act and blocking the passage of salmon as we speak, so he's talking about the current situation, how can we believe that they will pass fish with so many new gates? Has the Department of Ag, to, to anyone's knowledge, been given an official DFO warning in 2020 for mismanagement of these gates? Uh, it, we'll stop there because the next one is a, a separate question. Yeah, no, I don't think uh, CBCLRS can, can really answer that, and I don't know that we're prepared to speak to the uh, existing structure here today. And uh, we'll try and get uh, Julie Bailey's here. Julie, can you answer that? Um, Julie's uh, here the, um, in the place of Kevin. Uh, has it, Julie, has the Department um, of Agriculture been given an official DFO warning in 2020 for mismanagement of the gates? Um, sorry, the question was um, about the current operation. So we've, we're actually consulting with DFO on current operating conditions, and uh, we will continue to do so on a go forward basis. Um, the question specifically is, has Department of Agriculture been given an official DFO warning in 2020 for mismanagement of gates, of the gates? Sorry, I, I can't speak to that at this, at this session, so I'd have to get back. You on okay, that. can you find that out then? Yeah, I, I'm not sure if I if I can share that, but I can look into it. Uh, can you get back to us and let us, even if you, if the answer is you can't share it? Sure. Thank you. Is there enough, the next question was, is there enough fresh water to run these fish ladders all year? Um, I think that's already been answered, has it not? Yeah, we covered that in the various scenarios. It's different for each one. Uh, Jim Ivey, sedimentation is resulting in a filling in of the lake over time. Whether it sources upstream or, upstream or tidal, it's not clear if the design has any mechanism for allowing the sediment to be flushed out. Alex, do you want to jump on that one? <sighs> Um, well, it's, it's a very complicated question. It's a very complicated issue. Um, so we are actually still uh, assembling and fine tuning some, some models of not just the, the lake and its immediate area downstream, but really the entire estuary. So we've done quite a bit of additional measurements of uh, sediments and velocities. Um, of sediment concentrations at different uh, locations and different uh, depths in the water column. And we're, uh, we're calibrating those models and trying to get a, uh, a bit of a, an overall sense of how the entire system uh, might behave in the long term for the different uh, scenarios that we're considering. Um, but it's, it's a dynamic system and um, Flushing of the uh, of flushing can, can really only be done locally. Uh, so there is a system to to flush uh, the you know around the structure to make sure the structure can stay operational. The uh, as Colin described, the uh, fishways are self-flushing. 
to make sure that those don't uh, fill up with sediment. But uh, in, in a natural system, there's always going to be uh, an equilibrium that's going to, uh, to establish itself. And um, it's the more um, uh, towards a, a similar situation uh, the scenario moves towards in the future, if you know, uh, DFO instructs uh, that to happen, um, the more similar to uh, pre aguato conditions we would revert to. So it's not a very precise answer, but um, but, it, but in general, uh, there's going to be a new equilibrium, and um, there's, there's no practical way to flush the whole system. It just will adapt to its new uh, equilibrium. Okay, Darren asked, um, are you assessing the old causeway tunnels, the second barrier in your models, with a new barrier right in front of it? Yes. Uh, Darren uh, says that section 5.7.7.2, change in traditional use from the environmental assessment states, in quotes, it is therefore expected that these resources can be readily accessed by the Mi'kmaq for traditional uses, use, traditional use rather, in adjacent areas, end of quotes. Is this still the case? Sorry, it wasn't clear to me what, uh, what he was quoting there. Um, uh, the, the, um, from the environmental assessment that was done? The, the assessment uh, approval for this project? Uh, yes. Okay. It is there, therefore expected that these resources can be readily accessed by the Mi'kmaq for traditional use in adjacent areas. Yeah, so I mean, I think that's consistent with the objective of the project here to improve fish passage and, and making that, uh, that, 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 that fish resource, I think that's what's being referred to here. Uh, more plentiful and available uh, uh, so that they can uh, um, uh, you know continue continue their rights to uh, to fish on this on this system uh, again from Darren uh, and now I think you've already answered this but I want to ask it uh, because he's put it there what's the offsetting and compensation for the removal of the commercial fisheries I think you had said that that uh, is something that needs to be addressed yet yeah. yep okay uh, from Darren to everyone, um, no, sorry. Oh, uh, Sheldon, sorry about that, Sheldon, I'm going to skip by this. Uh, you mentioned a 2.1 meter lake level. That would be significantly lower than the current level of just under three meters. Why was this level chosen? No, the, the, the actual current level is, is pretty close to 2.1. I think the difference that we're talking about is datum. Uh, the, the level he's referring to would be the uh, the two thousand. Which two, which datum is it, Alex? Uh, would it be? It's a 20, 1928. 1928. Yeah, we're in the two thousand thirteen which is a, a, a 0.6 meter difference. Yeah, and just so everyone's aware, this is a vertical reference system. It's a reference system that's used for measuring elevation. Um, for anyone not familiar with the term datum. Oh right. Right. So there are different reference systems that have some variations. So I think that's, 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 uh, that answers the question. Um, can I ask that uh, somebody send an email to uh, Sheldon explaining that in more layperson's terms? Uh, it's, a, it's a hard one. Um, there, there is information on, uh, there's information on the Nova Scotia land surveyor site, the Canadian hydro, there's a, there's a number of resources online that discuss uh, vertical datum uh, for for survey purposes. But Colin, I don't think the the need here is to um, to make Sheldon aware of how to use uh, vertical datum. It, he wants to know is this signif is this new lake level going to be significantly less than what they've got no. now? Because no, the the the, the two point one. Is, is equivalent to about 2.8 or 2.7 in, in, in I think the data that he's referring to. So it's within the, you know, six or eight inches of, 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 the, of the current level. Okay. Uh, this is from Darren. Okay. Oh, continued dialogue on shutting down our fishery. There has been no dialogue 
uh, please correct your statement. Um, you're putting us out of work. So that, that's a statement and clearly Darren's not happy with the um, mention of continuous dialogue. He feels there hasn't, hasn't been any. And the uh, reason for that, uh, just to clarify, is the fact that the final details are just being uh, established right now. So we're at a point where we finally uh, have a good understanding of what the, the final footprint and the impacts are. So, um, you know, now is the time where uh, those those conversations and uh, uh, dealings with those affected by the project would, would be initiated. Jim Ivey uh, says the previous design appeared to check all the boxes. Um, so the previous design, I think, Jim's probably talking about uh, what was option C again, because he's referred to that before. The previous design appeared to check all the boxes, regulatory legal requirements of fish passage per DFO, rights requirements and consultation of First Nations, flood protection of farmers, freshwater needs of farmers and ski hill, and was utilized in 240 other global locations with high assurance of success for the design criteria from a cost-risk cost risk perspective it appears we're taking on a higher cost with lower likelihood of success, assurance of meeting all design, success in meeting all design requirements. Can you comment? Do you agree or disagree? Uh, that's, a, that's a lot to take in. Um, and I don't know what uh, specifically he mentioned about the previous option, uh, the previous design option. Uh, I'd like to get some clarification on uh, what option is being referred to there. So Jim, can you type that in on the bottom of the chat? But I think he's talking C, about C. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. 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 So C was part of, the, as I mentioned earlier, the the initial options that were developed uh, prior to consultation with uh, the public stakeholders, uh, with the Mi'kmaq, uh, particularly. Um, it was after we we developed those initial options. Um, that we, we heard uh, many, many different concerns, wide ranging concerns on the project that we tried to take in consideration and, uh, you know, come back with a, with a balanced solution. And that's what we feel this, uh, this chosen option is um, and what we're putting forward. And, uh, you know, there, as it, I think we mentioned earlier, there isn't a significant cost difference. Um, and uh, we feel like it is, is a better balance of uh, all, all uh, interests on this project. Yeah, and, and I mean, functionally, I, I'm not sure who who decided it ticked off all the boxes and, and all those various things, but, you know, option C is is essentially the same thing as the title estuary option that we're offering here, and really not not a whole lot different than the Brackish uh, Lake either, just a, a, a you know, a, a smaller tidal range. Yeah, so, so this structure, yeah, can, can, it's can operate under thing. that option C, yeah. and, and that is maybe part of that adaptive management and that evolution over time. Um, okay, so uh, Darren's got um, a question um, that uh, says it's an untested structure, a structure that's never been built elsewhere, bridges that are substandard to tidal flow, um, so it just, uh, may not perform the way computer models predict, eliminates com commercial fisheries and revolves around maintaining the lake level over Mi'kmaq rights. Is the mayor of the municipality on this call okay with this? Um, I'm going to uh, let the mayor answer that at another time if he likes. Um, he's here as part of the CLC to uh, ask questions and get information. And uh, it, um, there's other ways of asking the mayor for his positions on, on this sort of thing. Um, Jim Ivey, to my earlier question answer, I, not quite, this is some clarification that I've asked for, but I think I understood the explanation from Colin in light of previous from Alexander Wilson. The water with gates open is maintained at equilibrium, so there isn't tidal exchange, but the fish are swimming through walls of salt water to fresh water. Alex, are you there? Or? Yeah, uh, I'm here. I'm uh, just reading the question again to make sure I uh, I can answer it uh, properly. Um, the water with gates opened is maintained at equilibrium. Um, I think the answer sure. is that at the interfaces of, between salt and or salt water and fresh water, there's always going to be a, a, a mixing area, a mixing zone. Uh, so I, I think, I think uh, you know, the, 
you wouldn't expect to see any any walls of salt water. It's just that's just not the way water works. Yeah, maybe uh, what I was explaining before is uh, in a natural system, um, there's, there's a, what's called a salt water wedge. When the tide rises, it uh, slides underneath the fresh water, and the fish sometimes go through quite a sharp transition between salt water and fresh water. Uh, well, right. Uh, well, Jim has, Jim has written in the bottom now, he's got it mixed. There's a mixing zone. Walls was a bad term. Um, so I think he's satisfied with that. Um, uh, another question from Jim. Uh, th thank you, Alex, for your previous answer in my question, resediment and flushing. One point of follow up is your reference to new equilibrium. Is that effectively an increased filling in of the lake? The new equilibrium. Uh, right. So, so when I was sorry, when I was mentioning a new equilibrium, um, in effect, we're we're uh, not really sure uh, how things might adjust in the long term. In the short term, um, our models show not very much change, and you can see uh, the slide there that Colin has. It shows some sediment, suspended sediment coming in. And then, uh, you know, during during low tide, most of it is uh, is gone. But there has probably been some settling of sediment in between. So whether this is, you know, a, a fraction of a millimeter or five millimeters per tide, this is something that's really difficult to evaluate. Um, uh, it's this, so. This is why we're we're working uh, very hard right now, at trying to. Um, get a little bit of a better understanding of uh, how things might evolve in the future. But, um, you know, it, it, it is expected that things can change. And uh, we, we have some renderings there that show maybe the development of uh, some salt marsh, perhaps, with some increased salinity. Um, and it's, it's, uh, it's certainly possible that there's going to be some, uh, some settling of sediments as we allow some more uh, tidal exchange. Um, can I just ask Alexander, is there plans on monitoring that and being, that being part of the uh, evaluation of the, the facility and how it's managed? Uh, yes, actually, this is uh, monitoring of salinity and uh, suspended sediments um, and water quality, temperature. Uh, there's a whole range of parameters there that are planned to be monitored constantly before and after construction. Um, so yes, there's a pretty comprehensive uh, uh, monitoring plan that's being developed to, to again, uh, mostly focus on the, um, the quality of the habitat and the passage for, for fish and for the ecosystem supporting fish. And, and related to sediment as well, I, I haven't, we haven't talked to her directly about that specific question, but I suspect that uh, Danica and Smew uh, uh, will will likely be studying this uh, in the future as well. For their, you know, they've been working on studying the salt marsh in this area for for many years. So, I would uh, suspect they'll be quite interested, and we'll be doing uh, doing some work to to uh, keep an eye on things in parallel with anything that we do as well. Okay, we ha we're down to a couple of questions. Uh, uh, Darren says, in simple language, the EA states, and I guess it's a reference to what he was the what he had quoted before. The EA states the Mi'kmaq can go fish elsewhere. Does TIR still stand behind this statement? Yeah, I'm honestly, I'm not familiar with that statement or reference to that in the EA, but I, I'll repeat what I kind of said earlier. I think uh, not just a goal, but a requirement of this project is to improve fish passage. And, uh, you know, I, I like to think we demonstrated that, that that will be possible here, even under the freshwater lake scenario, you know, showing a pretty significant improvement. Um, so, uh, no, uh, I would say we, we don't stand behind that statement. Okay. Um, and then uh, Darren's making, makes a point. Enigma had nothing to do with the change from option C, that, and he makes a reference again to Deputy Minister Laflesh of TIR gave farmers and canoe clubs the say in a joint council meeting, the choice to eliminate option C, and that is on the record of that joint council meeting. So. Um, that's not a question. He's making that uh, point again. 
That's the end of the questions. Um, what was next? It, 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 was there more presentation, uh, Justin? No, that was it, okay. Ken. Yeah. Um, listen, folks, uh, I think we, we're, we'll wrap up. Um, I, I just want to say um, not everybody's going to leave here happy, right? Um, we know that, and uh, they, but we're in, in the process. And we've received a whole bunch of information from, uh, we've received an update here on where, where the status, what the status of the project is. Um, it's, uh, you know, there's more to be done here. Um, we've, we've heard in the past, there, and we all know that there are differing um, uh, areas of interest within the community. Um, and uh, there's been an attempt, obviously, to um, try and uh, to best meet the interests of the different parts of the community in their different in different area, different uh, uh, wants and needs, um, as long as well as the regulatory requirements and that sort of thing. Um, as I said, not everybody's going to be happy. Um, there's still a process to go through. Um, and, you know, there's, this is going to go to DFO and DFO is going to look at it and they're going to make a judgment on whether or not uh, um, this fish passage is going to be um, uh, adequate or not. So there's still quite a bit to go. There's, uh, there's been some discussion here about this, um, more engagement with the commercial fishery, more engagement with um, the uh, uh, Aboriginal communities with the Mi'kmaq. Um, so it's a work in progress and uh, um, we've received an update. I think that's important. Thank you, gentlemen, for um, providing this update. And uh, um, I guess we go on from here. Uh, can I ask you, Justin, um, do you think, when would you think that there'd be a next meeting or a next update, I guess, is uh, um, or can you can you give us an idea or like at what stage um, or what would be the next milestone when we would receive an update? Yeah, so it depends on a few things. Uh, obviously, I mentioned our submission to DFO is this month. So this is a, that's a major milestone. Um, the, the, the timeline that it will take DFO to review this again, they haven't received uh, detailed information on our proposal yet. So it's a little unclear uh, how long it will take for them to review. Uh, but I, I, I would think a logical point would be uh, following DFO's response or review. And once we understand uh, next steps ourselves, that would probably be a logical time for, uh, for, for a next meeting. Okay. Uh, um, I, I yeah. don't have a good sense from DFO's perspective yet how long it would take. Uh, it could be anywhere from a month or two to, you know, it could be six months. Uh, it, it all really depends uh, on their resources and, and how complex uh, uh, the review is. So, Okay. Um, thank you, gentlemen. And I, I just want to thank every person sitting here um, for making this meeting um, work and, you know, putting the, uh, putting the uh, comments into the chat window. And, it, you know, it's not the same kind of dialogue as having face-to-face um, -face discussions, but everybody, um, participated with respectfully and uh, and respected the um, difficulties or challenges I should say in having a meeting in uh, in a pandemic um, so thank you very much for that I as a facilitator I really appreciate that cooperation it it, uh, it made this meeting a lot easier I'd also like to thank people for for staying because uh, I generally try and keep meetings to uh, the timelines that I've given but it was very clear that uh, we needed to uh, have the answers to the questions. So thanks everybody. And with that, uh, we, oh, I just, uh, uh, I'm just gonna adjourn in a moment. I just wanna reiterate, as soon as I can, I'm going to get this recording um, online. I don't know how it, long it's gonna take for the wizards that um, to, uh, um, to get this recording um, done and uh, have it uh, in my uh, inbox. But as soon as I get it, I will post it. And I'm going to send it to all CLC members because I'm sure many of you um, have people um, in mind that you'd like for them to see it. So, all right. Anything to close, Justin? Or uh, otherwise, I'm going to uh, adjourn.
No, uh, just once again, yeah, thank you to everybody. And uh, uh, hopefully next time we meet, uh, we'll be under a better, uh, in a better format maybe. But uh, if not, everybody, uh, you know, take care. And uh, uh, thank you again. Thanks, everyone. We're adjourned.